Hi, Elon. Hey, Vikram. How are you? Very good. How's how's the weather in Como? Um, it's nice today. Um, sunny. It's a bit windy uh, today and yesterday. We've had great weather, but it's um, it's cooling down a little bit, and it'll be uh, it'll be raining, I think, uh, later uh, next week. So. Yeah, it's been nice. But I think ha, ha. So you, you you should actually set this up on your balcony. We should be looking out to Lake Como. How many people have this opportunity? Tell me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's quite central if you live in Europe. Uh, it's easy to get to. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I wanted to focus on the conversation more than the view. <laughs> what about me? I <laughs> I want to focus on that also. No, but tell me. We all keep talking about. Oh, look, you go to Italy and you really like these old towns and everything. But now you've been there for how many months? Um, I think uh, more than ten months now. I arrived at the beginning of July, um, so coming up to one year. So, what is it like to be living in Italy? One is holidaying in Italy. Now it's living in Italy. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. It's the first time I've lived here for such a long period of time. I was here for a few months in 2018, but it's totally different. Um, well, it's it's nice. I mean, you know, I think it's a great place to be uh, stranded um, during uh, you know the pandemic. Um, so I I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I mean, a very small village. Um, so it's a bit strange because. You know, I don't speak Italian, and many people here don't speak English, and so you feel a little bit like you don't, you know, really fit in. Um, but the people are very nice, and it's a beautiful part of the world, so not a bad place to be. But you've now got to know people. You've got to the houses. They're they're very hospitable people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just it's just difficult because of coronavirus. You know, I think that. Because everybody, my mum lives in this village. Um, it's sort of not too far from the town of Como, um, and you know everybody in the village knows my mum. Of course, there's only about six hundred people here in the village, so I think it would have been a much sort of more community type of experience uh, had it not been for the pandemic. Because obviously, you know, you don't want to be you know going to people's homes and things and everybody's a little bit worried about the virus situation so it's uh, it's difficult yeah but then but all this time i'm sure you've picked up the language it's going to be that difficult for you well you know i i did learn french at school so it makes sense and i think i could learn it quite quickly but if i'll be perfectly honest i haven't you know put much time into italian at all i mean only a little bit on duolingo just so that I can get by. Um, I spend much more time focusing on, you know, developing my conflict resolution and mediation practice and, and, and also my, ma- my media, uh, excuse me, my Mandarin uh, language skills. Um, so, you know. No, well, I think this is quite ideal actually, because if you normally people learn foreign languages and they don't get to speak to people. So it's all very classroom kind of thing, but actually living there to be able to practice the spoken language, it's a good opportunity. Yeah. It definitely is, and you know, I think that I, if I could turn back time, I would. I, if I knew how how long I was going to be here for, I would have been more <laughs> serious about it. However, what I would say is that you know, these villages are very small, and actually, they even have their own sort of local dialect. So it's quite different, even from Italian. So. It, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to learn Italian so well speaking to people from the village, I think. Okay. Well, that, but have you ever tried that Google Translate conversation on Google Translate? Um, not conversation, no, but I use it fun. for text. Yeah. It's good fun. It's good fun. You must try it. It's, it actually works. It actually works. Ah, okay. Well, you know, um, Google, they put a lot of money into things. So. <laughs> but you've picked up Mandarin. Yeah? That's not bad at all. Yes, so you know my journey with Mandarin has been long, um, but I'm I'm happy to say that I'm very um, uh, conversant in the Mandarin language. I use it in my professional life. Um, I first started in 2007 when I was still living in London. Um, I took a course at SOAS on the weekends, um, and then of course I I moved to China in early 2009 to Beijing, and you know sort of started studying. Uh, full time, uh, or actually part time at first, but then I did six month full time Mandarin study at Tsinghua University, 
and I've kept it up. And, uh, you know, I now I study in my free time. I listen to podcasts and learning new words all the time. So it's a real challenge because it's uh, especially reading and writing takes a huge investment of time. But you're fluent enough to have a proper debate on in Mandarin. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, there'll be words that I don't know, um, but I'm totally proficient. I'll be able to uh, get the meaning and then I can ask questions to uh, make the meaning clear. So I've used Mandarin in several of my professional roles previously. So I feel very confident with it these days, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's a long journey and it, uh, it'll, it'll be going until the day I die, I think. <laughs> No, but it must be very satisfying when you can actually have that kind of a conversation where you're actually maybe debating things, you're actually discussing to that level. It must be very satisfying. Yeah? That's... Absolutely. The, um, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a, a, an interesting language to learn. It's challenging because of how different it is to the um, uh, Latin-based uh, languages um, and, uh, and Germanic uh, languages. So... Uh, it's a great challenge. It's 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 a lot of fun to learn the characters, and it's a great sense of of achievement um, to be able to communicate with people, and as well, such a huge amount of the world's population. I mean, you know, maybe one fifth of 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 the world, one in uh, uh, five people in the world are are Chinese uh, people, and most of those can communicate in Mandarin. So it's it's a very important skill, which I make sure that. I, I maintain on even on a daily basis. I, I make sure that I am always looking at things in in Mandarin. And there were some really wonderful milestones of when I I, I lived in Beijing for almost five years uh, on the first occasion. I've lived in China on three different occasions, and I remember um, being in a taxi, uh, and um, uh, I remember the taxi driver was speaking on the phone and I could hear it was a female voice, I assume his girlfriend. And uh, she was uh, talking to him about things. And um, uh, all of a sudden he said to her, um, I can't speak right now. And she, I could hear on the other end, she said, why? And she said, I have a passenger in the car. And she said, who is it? And he said, it's a foreigner. And she said, well, what's the problem then? And he, he said to her in Chinese, he said, uh, which means that there's no benefit. And when he said that, I burst out laughing because I was just kind of so happy that I could sort of, I, I could finally get through situations where Chinese people were trying to uh, uh, say in secret that uh, they they shouldn't be speaking around me. Which means that if, when a foreigner goes into another into the country, another country, they should have a badge on them that I can speak your language because you were party to some very secret information. <laughs> well, exactly, but no, I don't want that badge. I want to be. I want you know. You want, I, well, yes. You want to get into people's <laughs> lives, th hear things which you otherwise won't hear. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and and of course. Most Chinese people assume that foreigners can't speak. Uh, exactly, Chinese. exactly. So, so you're really enjoying yourself. Huh? You sit, with, you know, sit somewhere and just keep listening to people talk about things, not even thinking once that the guy next to them can actually understand. <laughs> no, but tell me, well, this whole Cantonese thing, Cantonese is still quite prevalent or it's just Mandarin which has taken over? Um, so... Cantonese is, is spoken in, in the region of Canton, in, in Guangdong province in the south, and of course, Hong Kong, just uh, across the, um, the, the border um, with Hong Kong, spe special administrative region. Um, so that whole southern province of, of China is, uh, is, is Cantonese speaking. Um, but you will find that uh, m m most people in that region can speak Mandarin as their second language um, because uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party, when they came to power in 1949, um, went to, I think, quite a lot of effort to try to unify the country uh, in, in language terms. Um, and so even though the people in the South, uh, in, in Guangdong specifically, uh, their first language is Cantonese, 
uh, I think most of them, certainly on the mainland, um, can speak Mandarin quite well. I believe that a lot of people in Hong Kong still don't speak Mandarin that well. I mean, obviously, a lot of them do, um, but many people in Hong Kong speak Cantonese as their first language and English as their second language, mostly, I assume, because of the uh, influence of, of being a British colony uh, for, for uh, you know, 100 uh, or maybe 150 years. Mm, yeah, so so it might be changing now, but I remember um, I remember that uh, you know bit, bit, traveling to Hong Kong on numerous occasions, uh, Mandarin is is not so useful there. But you can't. I mean, you you can't understand. That's very different, is it? The Cantonese. Yes, it's it's a completely different dialect. I speak very little Cantonese. I can say uh, thank you and uh, hello, um, and you know. Some words will be similar, but it's actually very different. I mean, it's 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 really completely different. And so, people who only speak Mandarin and people who only speak Cantonese really have trouble communicating with each other. But but whenever I, like Google also says Chinese, it doesn't say Cantonese or, or Mandarin or whatever. So that Chinese, when we we should understand that to be Mandarin. Um. Yes. So yes, that's true. Um, but so there's a, there's a number of things to to be aware of here. So there's different writing systems. Um, so on the mainland you have simplified characters, mm -hmm. and off the mainland you have traditional characters. So in Hong Kong they use traditional characters, Macau, and also in Taiwan they use traditional characters. Um, so Google does have the ability to translate. Um, both simplified and traditional characters, um, but I mean I'm not aware of the of the voice uh, functionality, so I don't know if it can do Cantonese. But I would imagine that it's mainly focused on Mandarin. But how uh, do these characters characters work? I mean, if suppose you have you have to write Vikram in in uh, Mandarin, how do you go about it? What, what how does it work? So there is, in terms of pronunciation, there is a romanization system. Uh, which the, the main one of which is, is called Pinyin. And actually, I believe the founder of the Pinyin uh, romanization system uh, died recently. Um, so uh, anybody who's interested in that can, can look that up. So for instance, just you know, a very simple example, the capital of, of People's Republic of China, Beijing, will be uh, the, the two characters are Bei and Jing, um, and those two characters mean separately, Bei means north, and Jing means capital, so it's northern capital. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's a Nanjing in China, and actually Tokyo in, in Mandarin is uh, Dongjing, uh, which is eastern capital. So you, you can see the sort of, the, you can get the history of you know, how uh, the language has, has um, evolved um, you know, before uh, you know, different political uh, systems were, were so separate. Um, so, so in terms of Vikram, um, now there's no V uh, sound. So your name would most likely be something like, you know, Wei Ke Lam or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah, Wei Ke Lam. So, but, but the fun of that is that you can choose um, your characters. Um, that, that, that represent your name. So you can actually see on, on Zoom here, I have my, my Chinese names actually in traditional characters because I, I believe it looks nicer and it's kind of more poetic. So my Chinese name is Bai Yi Lan and those three characters mean Bai is white, the color. Um, Yi is um, righteous um, and Lan is orchid. Um, so my name together means white righteous orchid. Let me let me try and put it on uh, on Google Translate and let's see what comes out. Okay. It says why kela mu. What <laughs> why kela mu? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Can you see it? Um. Well, it's not okay. Yeah, hold it there for a second. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so ah, uh, also it says way way can is that kang? I ca I can't really. It it's says, very Way kela. It says kela. Way kela. Kela. Yeah. Moves. It's okay. a totally different. Yeah? No? Okay. Let me let me see. Actually, because I have a Chinese dictionary, and if I write Vikram, there might be. You see, because there have been people in history, you know, called Vikram, there might be an entry in the dictionary for your name. Ah, 
Mm -mm. Now I no. see there's a word Vikrama, but it's uh, no, I think this is something different. No. Um, yeah, but um, anyway, uh, I can help you with the Chinese name uh, later on if you're. If you're okay. Sure. So you basically divide it, and you have those characters meaning something, and then that kind of represents you in a way. Something. Yes, like that. absolutely. You can choose, you know, how you want to be uh, represented in to Chinese speakers. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, but the, but the, now we obviously gone straight to China. But you grew up in somewhere in England. Um, correct. Although I was actually. Uh, born in Israel. Um, I was born in Israel, uh, just outside of Tel Aviv, um, and uh, my parents were living there at the time, but my parents actually are both from London, and when I was about one, one and a half, they decided to come back to, uh, to the UK, and I grew up from the age of a baby uh, until I went to university in London. Um, so I consider myself a Londoner uh, through and through, uh, but um, uh, I, I left London actually in 2009 when I went to live in China and I haven't uh, been back to live in the UK on a permanent basis since then. So we're talking about you know, 12 years now. Wow. But then, but you still identify yourself as a Londoner. You do. Absolutely. I'll always be a Londoner. London is, in my uh, opinion, the greatest city in the world. And I've been to quite a few cities, including New York, Tokyo, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, you know, a lot of, oh, and New Delhi, of course. So, um, you know, I've been to a lot of great cities in the world. And London is very special to me because obviously I, I grew up there. My family's from there. Um, I was educated there. Um, and, um, you know, my, my football team is there. Awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the important one. <laughs> yes. That's right. No, but then still oh, it's a nice city, but you want to see, you still want to stay away from it. You know, I would, I would love to go back and live in London. Um, I, it's, it's absolutely a, you know, a, a privilege, um, uh, and a blessing to be from London. It's really a wonderful place. Um, the only thing is, is that, I lived there for, you know, what, 20 plus years. Um, and one of the reasons why I left London and went to live in China is because I felt like I was getting a little bit too comfortable. Um, I was working for a bank at the time. I'd been there uh, after I graduated in 2005 uh, for my undergraduate degree. Um, you know, I, I worked for the bank for over three years. The global financial crisis had just uh, started. And I felt, you know, this is too comfortable. Uh, I'm not really interested in financial services. So let's get out of here and let's shake things up a little bit and get out of my comfort zone. Um, and I always wanted to live in, in East Asia. My undergraduate degree actually was East Asian studies. I did that at the University of Sheffield uh, in South Yorkshire in England. Um, and so I really wanted to go and live in East Asia to sort of put into practice um, the studies uh, that I had learned in my undergraduate degree. But how come East Asian studies? What attracted yeah. you there? So that's that's an interesting story. I mean, funnily enough, I, I was enrolled to do economics. Um, I did economics, uh, politics, and history for my A-levels. And economics, uh, I got an A. That was actually my, my best grade. Um, and I loved economics. I had a fantastic economics teacher um, at, uh, at my secondary school. Um, and so that's basically why I went to do economics. And I deferred for one year and did a gap year. And uh, in fact, so you'll know, have to rewind to like, tell this story a little bit because so after my A-levels, I went with a friend traveling around Japan. Um, you know, we were just interested in technology and we went, two of us, it was an incredibly expensive uh, two week trip of Japan as we discovered, we discovered on arrival at the train station that even a bowl of noodles is, is not cheap in, in, in Tokyo. Um, but, you know, it was really a, a uh, you know, sort of transformative uh, moment in my life uh, when I saw the modernity and the cleanliness and, and the safety and the, the, you know, the interesting aspects of, of life in Japan. So that was really a, a big moment in my life. And then, so I took a year out, I worked for a bank for nine months, uh, earned some money. And then I went traveling for three months with uh, a, a big group of friends of mine, all guys, uh, sadly. Um, and we went, you know, we did kind of the, the typical British uh, gap year backpacker thing, Australia, New Zealand, 
And then we went to Bali, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, and Japan. So I was actually, that was the second time I'd been to Japan. And so when I got to Sheffield, I was doing economics and I found it very mathematical. Um, and I was taking lots of maths homework home each night. And I was thinking, you know, this is not what the university is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about something you feel passionate about, you're interested to learn. I mean, I do really am fascinated by economics still to this day, but I, I, I knew immediately that I'm not a mathematical kind of person. I'm more of an arts type person and I, I changed. So what I had done in, I think the first week of university was add Japanese language modules into my uh, economics degree. So I thought do economics with Japanese that might be, you know, better for my sort of career progression. Um, and when I met uh, people in the Japanese class, the language classes, they were doing this subject East Asian studies for their major. And when I just I was struggling with the with the maths, um, I went to sit in on on some of the East Asian studies lectures. And I remember to this day very vividly, the first lecture was in a course called Imperialism in East Asia. And it was about the Opium Wars, um, the first Opium War that uh, Britain and China, Qing Dynasty, uh, China um, fought uh, in from 1839 to 1842. And I remember thinking to myself, this is incredible, you know, like, how is it that Britain fought this war over, you know, the rights to trade, the rights to trade a highly ad addictive substance? And how is it that I don't know about this, being a British person? And so, you know, obviously, we just don't learn about these things in our sort of lower British uh, curriculum. And I changed, I had, I had to change within the first four weeks of the year. And I remember, I remember speaking to my mom and telling her I'm, I'm, I'm ditching economics and I'm taking East Asian studies. And of course I kept the Japanese language modules. So I did East Asian studies with Japanese for my undergraduate degree. And I think, you know, I did, I did uh, my degree 2002 to 2005. China was very much lower on the radar back then. Um, and so given the development of China, uh, the development of China's economy and political and social issues, you know, we can see now with, you know, what's going on with coronavirus and things, I, I think it was, a, it was a great decision to, to switch my degree. But when you say East Asian studies, what all is covered under that? What all do they teach you in that? Yeah, so it's um, it's it's wonderful, um, and actually, University of Sheffield is one of the world's most uh, well-known centers of uh, excellence for the study of East Asia. I think it's a little bit stronger in Japanese studies, but um, obviously, East Asia is China, Japan, and the Koreas, North and South Korea. That's the region uh, as they teach it at Sheffield, and it's everything to do with the region. I mean, certainly. Uh, you know, various aspects of history. So economic development, political development, cultural studies, you know, there's a, they, they have these great courses on, uh, you know, Korean cinema. Um, they do, um, or we did rather, uh, you know, lots of classes on business culture in Japan and Korea and, 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 uh, and, and, and China, of course. Um, classes on the religious traditions of, of East Asia, you know, uh, um, um, Buddhism and um, uh, the spread of Christianity and Islam. Um, and even I remember one very short part of a lecture on Judaism <laughs> uh, in, uh, in, in East Asia. So um, yeah, fascinating. It's, it's humanities uh, faculty subject and um, just brilliant. Um, I, I loved it. Um, I'm still in touch with some people that I did my degree with. So, yeah, and uh, no, obviously- but just, so, no, but it's, just, it's no, but I'm just thinking that when you say, okay, if you talk about say Japanese culture, whatever, but yeah. how, I mean, do you really get into the regional aspect of a country or is it still a very broad kind of thing? Okay, now we're talking about Japanese culture. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, you know, it's an undergraduate degree. So you have three years, it's a three year degree like most degrees in, in the UK. Although I would say actually that if you, cause you can also specialize in a country. So you could do China studies or Japan studies or Korea studies. And with those degrees, 
you can do a placement year in the country, whereas with East Asian studies, you don't. And I, I think maybe they've changed that now. And I, I think it would have been great for me to, I most likely would have gone to Japan because I was more interested in Japan's post-war economic uh, uh, redevelopment, um, sort of, you know, post-war miracle. Um, so, but they didn't, they didn't uh, offer that to the East Asian studies students uh, for some reason. But anyway, to answer your question, it's difficult, you know, obviously, you know, to, to cover three countries um, in, 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 a, in such a period of time, obviously you can, you can specialize in one country and you can spend your whole life learning about that country. So yes, I think it's, it's obviously a foundational uh, um, uh, you know, preparation for a, you know, for a career, you know, maybe in academia or in other professional areas to do with East Asia, but, you know, I mean, what I found certainly after living in, in China for a number of years in a couple of different places is that, you know, anybody who calls themselves a China expert, I say, be beware of, of those. <laughs> kinds of people. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, nobody is an expert in China. You could maybe be an expert on a very specific place or a very specific theme of China, but it's, it's, a, it's too big a country with too long a history uh you know it's uh, yeah it's impossible that's exactly the good i'm comparing it with supposing someone says i've done indian studies mm -hmm. india studies whatever i mean it's so huge to be able to give someone one broad idea about india in a way it's not right also <laughs> because i mean there's so much diversity and obviously like you said it's undergrad studies you can't get into too much also i mean even in terms of history also how much can you really get into there's so much so I mean, this this thing is okay. Maybe it's just like a flavor of the place, just to get you interested in things, and then you get more. If you want, you get would jump into it and get more detailed information. I don't yeah. know how that works. No, but when you do these studies, I mean, okay, history is one part. History is yes, but cultural studies, and then you go into the country, and I mean, did you actually end up traveling into the interiors of Japan, or it was largely the cities? So I've, I've been to Japan three times and they came, that was 2001, 2002 and 2003. I was fascinated after that first trip about Japan. I did do quite a lot of traveling around on, mostly on the first trip actually, because I went just with one friend and uh, we had a rail pass, we, we got on the trains. Actually, he had a cousin who was studying in a small town outside of Kyoto at the time. And that was really interesting to meet somebody who was uh, kind of living out there. So yeah, I did get around a little bit. Um, the, 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 the latter two trips, uh, I was uh, staying with a friend of mine who, uh, and actually we had a little group of us, whose uh, dad was, was working in Tokyo at the time. So that was great because accommodation is incredibly expensive in Japan. Be, yeah. <laughs> Even hostels, uh, as I learned on the first trip, are really expensive. I mean, they're wonderful because they're clean and they're safe and you know, they're really comfortable, um, but uh, very expensive. Um, so yeah, I'd say that I did more travel on the first, but all of the travel I did is in the central Kansai region. So, you know, between sort of Tokyo and Kyoto and Osaka, the sort of three main cities in, in that region. Um, so, you know, and just some little towns, uh, climb Mount Fuji once, uh, which is, which was a really magical experience on the first trip, um, but yeah, sure, there's loads of Japan, which, you know, for some reason, all, all the time that I lived in China, I, I never once got on a plane and flew to Japan because obviously China is so big that when you're living in China, you want to see China. So, you know, I, I kind of regret that a little bit now because, you know, Japan is, is still a very wonderful place uh, for me. Um, but yeah, sure, I want to go to Hokkaido, the Northern Island, and of course, Kyushu, the Southern, you know, the tropical parts. Um, yeah, I, I'm really... Well, that, but culturally, because I, as I understand, it's very, very interesting in, in terms of the what's happening inside, I mean, maybe into the villages or the smaller places. Yeah. I think that it's a different world. I mean, everywhere, obviously, the different worlds there, but it's supposed to be very interesting in terms of the culture. Wow, absolutely, yeah, yeah, and, and Japan has an, an Aboriginal uh, culture as well. There's the Ainu people um, who sort of were there, you know, before the, the Japanese people. Um, so it's you know you can get lost in any country's history and culture, um, and it's wonderful, you know. And I'm kind of more focused on China now, just because I live there, and 
uh, because of you know keeping up with my language and, and just because I think China is is the more sort of interesting or not interesting but you know uh, sort of pressing uh, you know uh, issues related to the world um, I think is is obviously China. The well, interesting thing is that these countries, when they actually can retain their arts and culture, I think that's a that's a good thing if people if countries can do that, because with the way the a uniform kind of a culture that we're developing all over the world, that should not let that part go. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I think you know local local cultures. I mean, I mean, look at a place like Italy. You know, every different town has, and and certainly China as well, has got its own language it you know got its own dialect and and types of foods that they make in those in those specific regions so yeah absolutely local culture is is very important and sure it's 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 also important that we can come together to collaborate on the issues that that and the challenges that we need to overcome so that we can live in a a a, a, a more peaceful and 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 clean and safe uh, world um, but absolutely, we shouldn't we shouldn't be losing our local cultures. Yeah. No, because like you, I mean, Como is a very interesting example that you land up in a place. Now your integration with the village has that happened? How what that that experience should be interesting. That'll tell us when we uh, want to adopt other cultures. What are we really looking at? Are we wanting to integrate, or are we looking out for things that we want to look out for, which we are familiar with? How does that work? Yeah, good question. Um, so. I, I suppose I should speak more from my China experience. I mean, I remember when I arrived in China, I went to teach English. I mean, I, I later worked for the UK government in, in at the embassy in Beijing, but I, I went out teaching English, learning Mandarin. Um, and of course, the, I had actually a, a few, well, one very close friend in, in Beijing uh, who, who had been living in China, uh, you know, for that, for the sort of, a couple of years previously. And so I knew someone and I, I, I also knew a few people in his social network. And of course, most of them were English teachers. So in the first few, at least months or maybe even year of living in China, I was mostly socializing with, with English teachers, whether they were British people, um, Americans, of course, Australians, uh, Kiwis, maybe a few Kiwis, um, maybe some South Africans um, and, you know, also Europeans as well, French. Uh, um, those are the types of people that sort of gen tend to stick together. You know, you, you work together, you play football together, you go out, you know, maybe drinking together. Um, but I think from a very early time, especially I think because I had the background, my undergraduate degree was in East Asian studies. And also because I learned some Mandarin before I even arrived in China, it was much easier for me to, uh, also socialize with Chinese people. I mean, that's why I was there. I was there to learn about China. So although it's great to have a network where, you know, you, you feel comfortable um, socializing with people, you also want to meet the people who live there because that's the best way to learn about the place, to, you know, learn about them and their lives and communicate with them and, uh, you know, to build your network in a foreign country. That was really important for me from 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 the start and um yeah even to this day you know i i uh i have a big network of, of chinese friends and um yeah you know I, even when i was living in israel when i did my master's degree i of course met many chinese people while i was there but how did that happen i mean when meeting these people was how part of work or is it mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, even when I was teaching, obviously you have teaching assistants and the other um, sort of management staff in the schools. Um, when I was at, working at the British Embassy, there were uh, Chinese people working in, in the office, um, also some Filipino people working in the British Embassy. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you meet people all over the place, um, socializing, of course. But easy to get into uh, their lives and the social life with them is something where you end up actually socializing to the extent that you're going into their houses and being part of that also? Or is it just socializing outside? Um, well, you know, I think Chinese people are very welcoming and um, uh, they're very happy to have foreign people come to, to stay, at, um, you know, to, to experience festivals and things. Um, and also, you know, of course, I, I, um, 
I, I, I met somebody, I had a romantic you know, relationship while I was living in China. Um, so I met her family and, and got very close to her family. And we later married and uh, wow. we're no wow. longer married. Um, but um, uh, you have to tell us why are you not married? Why? Yeah, that part is the one that we want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we'll come to that in a bit later. But um, it was it was really fascinating, you know, and really nice for me to uh, get to know a Chinese family, really, you know, very nice people. Um, and they welcomed me very warmly into their family. Um, we were together actually for seven years and married uh, for two of, of those years. Um, so, you know, we realized it, it, it wasn't the right, um, you know, it wasn't the right uh, relationship um, for the two of us. Um, but, but is that, but is person, people oriented as people or was it the culture, the cultural aspect has come in? What? No, I don't think it's culture. I think it's more on a personal level. I mean, maybe there's obviously aspects of, of culture because culture is something that can be broken down to something very small. And, and then, you know, you've got the culture of, you know, the family that you grow up in, and then you've got the culture of the country that you live in, or, you know, uh, your, your, your ethnic and sort of, you know, background and, and everything in between. So, it's too difficult to say, well, was it the culture? Yes, I mean, obviously there, there's cultures, different aspects of culture that, that, that were obviously very important to the reasons why you know, we felt that uh, we didn't want to stay together. But um, I think really more on a personal um, um, sort of values uh, level, you know, like exactly. uh, that's what I was. Yeah, I wanted to get it because I was trying to break it down to one: is it language? First of all, is does language play a role in it? Then do we look at values? Because what really happens? Because when you're cross, cross culture, it's a very interesting thing to study. I'm sure you studied it. I mean, you tried to study it, but breaking it up into parts and seeing where does that compatibility issue come up and why does it come up. That should be interesting to see because this is something to look. You were, of, of course, really kind of integrated in that sense. So for that, it'll be one extreme example. But in general, when you get into cultural integration, these are interesting things. It'll be a good experience to understand what you went through. Yes, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult to say, I think. Um, you know, I was heading in a direction of... Uh, so I made the decision to leave China and go and live in Israel to do my master's degree, which I did in conflict resolution and mediation at, at Tel Aviv University. And actually I went with my partner and um, we married while we were living in Israel. So a very interesting experience to uh, you know, be, be in a relationship with a Chinese person while living sort of in a third country, really. I mean, I am an, an Israeli citizen, I'm both British and Israeli, so I do very much consider myself an Israeli, but culturally, I suppose I'm, I'm not very Israeli. And uh, I'd only, I'd only uh, visited uh, Israel twice before I uh, went to live there, once when I was 11 and once when I was 25. And I went to live there when I was 30. So uh, it was quite a foreign environment, even for me. So to go there with uh, you know, a Chinese person who, you know, is, is it, it was also her first experience living outside of China. So yeah, that's, that's a really challenging experience to go uh, to, to sort of like a third country and live there, um, especially one as sort of unique, uh, culturally unique as, as Israel, because obviously Israel is, is, uh, is, a, is a majority Jewish uh, country. Um, and so, there are some attitudes in the country where it's difficult to bring a non-Jewish person into the country, you know, to, to live there. I mean, some, you know, I, I didn't have many problems in that area, but some people kind of look at you a little bit strangely that you would, you would, uh, you would marry a non-Jewish person and, and choose to live in Israel with a non-Jewish person. So it's complicated. Interesting. It's going very interesting because I mean that's quite a cross-cultural experience. A London Londoner goes to China, has a person who he moves to Israel and gets married there. I mean, interesting. Ilan, you have to tell us more about these experiences. Yeah, sure. I mean, we didn't we didn't actually marry in Israel, interestingly enough, because 
Israel is a very interesting place in that you have to marry somebody of the same religion as you in Israel. So yep. you, a Jew has to marry a Jew, a Muslim has to marry a Muslim or a Christian. I mean, maybe, you know, it's different. <laughs> I don't know. But you see the laws in, in, in Israel regarding, and I'm no expert on this, so, you know, don't, don't quote me, but um, you cannot marry officially uh, in Israel to somebody of a different religion than you. That's I mean, you could interesting. Do, yeah, that's... You do a civil, civil uh, service, yeah. but, but even the civil ceremony, I think maybe wouldn't be recognized. So there's really interesting quirk in that lots of Israelis go to, I think, Cyprus to get married. <laughs> if wow. they're marrying, if it's a Jewish Israeli, uh, if they're marrying a, a non-Jew. And of course there are lots of interfaith marriages in Israel because there's, it's a very interfaith kind of place. I mean, you know, Jerusalem is very important for Judaism and Islam and Christianity. And uh, uh, so, you know, there, there are interfaith marriages. So um, we, so we married, uh, we did our uh, civil ceremony in New York um, and uh, we, we had our party in Lake Como. <laughs> What, what countries have you left out in this whole deal? China, yeah. Israel, US, UK, Italy. <laughs> what do you, you, yeah, I mean, this is like being an ambassador for everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I consider myself a citizen of planet Earth and yes. a very world uh, sort of uh, oriented um, person. Um, so I actually have, I have family in the United States. You know, my, my mom is, is one of four. Um, and she has two brothers who went to live in, in the US when they were about you know, 20 or so years old. And my mom and my auntie stayed in, in the UK. Um, so my family on my mom's side is split between the UK and the USA. So now I think, have you made a list out of all this? How many countries are involved in your life in some way or the other? <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a few. I mean, I also have, I've, my, my grandfather lived in Spain for many years. He's sadly passed away um, a few years ago, uh, the, the ripe old age of 96, I believe. Not bad. Um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he had really, really good, uh, good, good innings, as we say, in using a cricket, uh, yes. <laughs> cricket metaphor. <laughs> um, and I have, you know, some kind of distant cousins who live in Australia, who I, I went to meet for the first time um, in 2017 when I was back working in Beijing. So, yeah, they're kind of spread around a little bit. And my auntie as well is, is, is uh, my mum's sister is in Spain. Um, at the moment, so I still have some family in Spain. So yeah. do you realize, Ilan, that you have quite a cross-cultural experience? Now you have to teach us. First of all, you have to tell us what is that common thread that you found within people all throughout? You know what? I think there's, there's much more that unites humanity than divides it. Um, of course, people have different ideas, and, and that is something that should be celebrated, um, which is, I think, where where conflict resolution practitioners come into the equation, um, because obviously some people don't know how to manage those differences of, of opinion. Um, uh, but um, there's much more that unites us. I mean, obviously it's all about needs at the end of the day, physical needs, psychological needs, and we're all human, you know? Uh, you know, you talk about, you know, different races and racism, in, it's my view, and I believe, I don't want to say the right view, but there's only one race, and that is the human race on this planet. Um, and um, we all need the same things, um, you know, physical needs and psychological needs of humans are essentially the same. And I think the faster we realize that, the sooner we'll be living in a more peaceful world. Wow, Ilan, that's like amazing message. <laughs> but no, but I'm saying a little more about it. I mean, really, if when you think about the people that you met all throughout, what is it that connected you with them? Was there a, was there something common that you connected on? I mean, oh, fun is of course you would talk about football and you talk about Arsenal and this and that, whatever teams they are supporting. That's one conversation. So that unites people to a certain extent. So that's one kind of uniting. But what about uh, uh, what else? Well, food, you know, everybody loves food, right? Everybody needs food. Everybody enjoys food. 
Um, that's a great um, sort of cultural uniter. Also divider actually as well, like the funny example, you know, there's the, this thing in the Middle East about, you know, who makes the best hummus, right? <laughs> you know, is it the Israelis? Is it the Palestinians? Is it the, the Jordanians? So, you know, it's, um, you know, I mean, I don't think it's, uh, I, if that was the only thing that did divided people in the Middle East, I think, you know, it would be a much uh, better situation out there. But yeah, food, um, you know, well, God, kind of putting me on the spot here, but um, just things that we do in our lives, right? Family, we all, we all love our families. We all, you know, maybe at times get annoyed by our families. Um, you know, we can, we can unite around that. Um, education, we all, I think, appreciate opportunities to learn things and develop ourselves and have, have, uh, personal and professional opportunities to, to, to feel like we have uh, uh, worth in this, in this world, in this, in this crazy capitalist world that we, that we live in. Um, so there's loads of things that, that I've connected with, with people on. Um, and I'm really enjoying actually in this stage of my life, you know, I, I finished my master's degree in 2014. Um, so I've been on my conflict resolution journey for about you know, seven years now. And I'm really enjoying, certainly because of the pandemic, it's one of the good things for me that came out of it, is networking with all these wonderful people who work in this crazy field of, of conflict resolution, like I'm doing right now. I mean, it's a, it's a real uh, honor and privilege. Please, to be don't even say that. Don't embarrass me now. <laughs> That's like... I'll save it to the end. I'll save it to the end. <laughs> no, but but in, but in general, in terms of food, now when you're out in, in China and you're with people there, you would eat anything that they were eating. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I don't have dietary requirements. Um, I, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to have the China experience. You know, I didn't want to go there and, you know, eat, uh, um, you know, sandwiches. You know, um, I mean, it's funny actually because you know when I first arrived. You know, you go to a restaurant, you're like, what do I do? I don't know how to order food, you know? So some restaurants have picture menus. So you just open the menu and point. Um, um, so that's useful. But I remember when I first arrived in, in Beijing in 2009, in the cold Beijing winter in February, um, I, I started eating McDonald's, you know, I found myself relying on that sort of that, you know, and I, I don't like McDonald's, but it was just, you could go in there and you could say, you know, give me that one. So, um, but then as time went on, I started, you know, then I moved on to, you know, I learned how to say beef noodles, right? And then I was eating beef noodles for weeks on end. Um, and then I, you know, learned how to say dumplings. And after teaching English, you know, I'd come, come home and, you know, get a few bags of dumplings and, um, and you just, you know, that's how you, you grow. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, Chinese food is, is incredible, right? I mean, it's one of those cultures like India, like Italy, like maybe Japan as well, where France perhaps, where food is just sort of so central to the culture and it's so diverse and, and everything about it is, is, is just, you know, magical. So it was really such an incredible experience living in China because I think people who live in, let's say England or the United States, when you say Chinese food, you get this image in your, your mind um, of, of obviously fried things and things kind of coated in, in sauces and the variety of food that's available in China. Because obviously every region has its own speciality. I mean, I remember uh, having my first hot pot. I don't know if you are familiar with the Chinese food of hot pot. No. It's, it's, it's a Northern uh, type of food because um, it's, uh, you know, kind of good for so, you know, cold winters and everything. Um, although it's, you know, I think it's eaten all over the place. Um, so hot pot or guo guo in, in Mandarin. Um, so you have a pot of, of oil and then the restaurant brings you raw meat, if you eat meat and raw vegetables, um, kind of, you know, the whole array, different meats, different vegetables. And you dip things. It's kind of like a sort of like a fondue maybe, but, but with, you know, with, with oil in, instead of cheese. Um, and so you, you just, you get your chopsticks and you just dip the meat and the vegetables in the hot pot. And it's such a social way to eat because, you know, it's like, 
there's battles over you know who put what in the pots and who's taking out whose food and you know, I remember going to hot pot restaurants with friends you know my my good friend um uh Natan who and, and Emily who who were uh you know still uh, living there before they left and those were such fun evenings and you know bottles of beer and uh, just, you know, the, the restaurant is full of people. It's bursting at the seams. It's, you know, so much action and everything going on, um, just everything on the menu. I remember always, you know, there was always this one page of the menu that just had a picture of a turtle on it. And, you know, <laughs> you know, we never ordered the turtle, of course, because it's Why? like, you know. <laughs> Why? You should have tried it. Why not? <laughs> I, I mean, I did try some crazy things. Including... Oh, you have to tell us about that. Yeah, all of those things you have to tell us. So I, one thing which I remember trying, I didn't order it. I have to, you know, caveat, uh, preface what I'm about to say, because, you know, I'm a dog lover. I know lots of dog lovers out there. My sister has a dog. You know, I grew up with dogs. I'm a total dog lover. When I remember when um, my students at the university that I was teaching at in Beijing, they took me out for a meal, I think, you know, just before I left the university and um, somebody ordered dog. <laughs> How was it? How was the meat? If you have to tell us that. I mean, you know, like sort of kind of like a, you know, like a tender kind of, you know, lamb or something. I don't know. You know, it I, it wasn't great. It just, you know, I don't think. I think, yeah, I think for people, I think it's just the concept of eating a dog must be something in their mind. But you are eating so many things. You're eating a cow. So what? what yeah. why should a dog be any different in that sense? Uh, I totally agree with you. And um, it, this is the thing, like, you know, people, I think in, in certain societies, maybe let's say Western countries, you know, certainly of course, you remember when the pandemic started and, you know, people, I think some people were saying, oh, you know, Chinese people eating everything and everything, but, you know, it's, it's a country of 1.4 billion people. It's yeah. like, you eat what your, is in your culture to eat. The fact exactly, that- exactly. You know, yeah. I actually think that the fact that in England you go to a butcher and you never see an animal head, that's strange. That's really strange. You know, why is it that we don't, you know, what does do they throw the head away? Like, I mean, I, I don't know what happens, but people should know that you're eating an animal and exactly. taking the head away. Like in China, you go to a restaurant, you order a fish. The fish always comes with the head on. But, you know, when you order a fish in a, in a restaurant in the UK or wherever, there's no head, it's filleted, no bones, you know, so you don't even realize that you're eating a fish. It's like, okay, you know, it's a fish, but it's like, you don't think that somebody pulled it out of the ocean yeah. and that maybe we might not have fish one day. So, you know, we need to have a greater connection. And, and, and I am a meat eater, I eat all kinds of meat, but I eat uh, very, meat in quite small quantities. And I want the meat that I eat to be very fresh. You know, I, I want to know that it's come from a place where the animal wasn't mistreated. You know, I don't want to eat meat from factory farms where the animals are very close together. No, I, I do not want to support that industry any longer. And so I'm quite, you know, maybe not as much as I should be, but, you know, and I think that's one of the good things about Italy, people, take their food very seriously here and i think that i i would hope but anyway that the animals are treated quite well in this country because they're very serious about food in italy that was is exactly what you were saying about the initial part of the pandemic the wet markets in china everyone talk, was yes. talking about and they, exactly the same thing that they eat anything and i, I was exactly telling them this i mean eating a chicken for a person who's been only a vegetarian and has been in a society which is totally vegetarian, eating a chicken and, I mean, something like what Kathleen was saying, you're living with those chicken and you're playing with them and then suddenly you take them to the side and you just chop them up and eat it. So I think I think we should not be looking at that part of it at all. But at the end of the day, did you try some interesting things, bat soup and something, something? No, I mean, no bat soup, uh, no shark fin soup. Snakes, some snakes, some something interesting. Um, no, not really. I mean, you know, I, just kind of just just interesting parts of of animals, you know, because they in China they use all of the animal, which I think is is the way it should be. You know, why is 
you sort of they only use the, the breast meat or whatever. That's crazy. Um, it's probably the least, um, you know, tasty part of, of the animal. So, um, you know, like if you go to a, a um, like a cow row uh, restaurant, a, a roasted uh, uh, meat um, place, you've got every part of the animal. Sorry, <laughs> it always makes me laugh when I look at the menu and there's, you know, you scroll down the menu, chicken, chicken wing, chicken feet, and then you've got chicken butt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I might have eaten chicken butt at some point. Um, <laughs> no, but have you had, have you had crickets? Um, I don't think. I mean, I, I'm not averse to eating. No, that. but this I, I, this I had in Thailand, not in China. In Thailand, right. well, you, you could you can find this stuff in in kind of food markets um, uh, and in you know uh, um, you know yeah, but no, I mean you know it just. Uh, different parts of the animals but okay. no not, not my 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 concept is if a local is eating it i'll eat it whatever right. it might be whatever right. it might be i don't even get into that as long as they look locals been eating it they know they, they know what it's all about right it's not going to kill you so exactly then kill them it won't kill you so that's quite okay right. but you have to tell us more about israel israel is interesting that yeah. part of it huh? yeah yeah absolutely so you know i was born there but i didn't um, didn't uh, didn't you know don't even remember it I think I was one and a half when my parents moved back to London um, so the the very reason that I was born there is quite interesting you know my dad um, who sadly passed away quite a few years ago um, was very passionate about Israel and what you would call a political Zionist so somebody who believes in in the state of Israel being the homeland of, of the Jewish people, um, but, but from a political and, and not a religious uh, standpoint. Um, and, you know, he actually went, he volunteered in 1967 when the Six Day War um, was, was going on. So it, it meant a lot to him. And he, I believe the story is, is that he persuaded um, my mum to uh, drive when she was pregnant uh, to uh, from London to Tel Aviv, um, so that yeah to drive. Wow! Yes. wow. They, they took the boat actually from um, Venice, uh, from Venice to Haifa. Um, mm -hmm. So so and and you know how my dad uh, managed to persuade my mom to uh, <laughs> drive to Israel when she was pregnant and to deliver a baby in August, as I was born in August, you know, so you can imagine how hot uh, it is in August in, in Israel. Um, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, I, I think I'm quite a persuasive person. So maybe my dad also had some good skills of, of persuasion. But um, yeah, so that, that was the reason I was born there. And then, as I said, I only visited twice, um, uh, once in 94. 95 and then when I was 25 in in uh, 2008 2008 yeah but this is so all I, at, in Tel Aviv in Tel Aviv or other parts also um let's see I mean it's such a small country that you can get anywhere really very quickly um but um yeah mo mostly Tel Aviv but Jerusalem of course you know Jerusalem is 45 minute drive away from uh, Tel that's Aviv. it Okay. But Jerusalem yeah. must be an interesting place. With fascinating, fascinating. It's um, it's just uh, I marvel uh, every time I go to that city, um, and um, yeah, very very special place. And you know, I'm not even sort of that sort of interested in in you know theology and, and and different religions. But when you go to that city, you can't help but be uh, captured by you know just uh, all of these sort of you know, thousands of thousands of years of, of religious traditions and, you know, the, the story of, of, of the Jewish temple, you know, the destruction of, 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 the, of, of two temples and, of course, you know, the story of Jesus and, and, and all of that. So when you're there, it's very real um, and um, people, you know, take it very seriously, of course, which is why um, it's, it's been a very contested um, city and is home to Judaism's most holy site, the Western Wall of, of, the, of the Second Temple, and, and also Islam's um, third uh, most holy site, the um, Dome of the Rock, Dome al-Sharif. Um, al um, and um, and um, 
uh, after after um, Mecca and Medina. So yeah, it's just you know when you as a Jewish person, I mean, as I said, I'm I'm, I'm I consider myself sort of spiritually secular, um, and when you walk out on the Kotel on the Western Wall Plaza. Uh, you know, you really get goosebumps. Um, and I always, you know, I always go to the wall and leave a note. I write a little prayer and leave a note in the wall and, um, you know, kind of just uh, go and touch the wall. It's, it's really special. But have you ever, I mean, have you read about all those, all these religions? Have you read something there, what their teachings are? So not really um i'm i'm more of a person you know kind of uh, like to live in the in the modern world and, and don't, don't get me wrong it, it's not that i don't think that there's a lot of wisdom there but i just think that um for me personally it's more important that we are you know thinking about what the challenges of the future are not that you know you can't address the challenges of the future with ancient texts but uh i just I'm more focused on on kind of what's going on in in, in the present. Um, but I did so. My primary school was Church of England, and you know we read hymns and 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 things like and you know sang songs in assembly and everything. Um, so and and my secondary school was a Jewish secondary school. So I you know I got sort of a lot of the you know we we had Jewish studies classes and learned about the festivals and some of the teachings, but. You know, um, yeah, it's 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 well, not something that. I'm well, what are those to. teachings? I've been asking people about that. What are those teachings? What are, what do they say? Um. Yeah. God. I mean, putting me on the spot here. I'm not. I'm really not the right person to ask about this because I haven't. Right studied. now, you're the only person I can ask. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, I just. I. I mean, one thing that I think comes very. Uh, it's, it's sort of very well known about Judaism is that is the sort of the culture of questioning. So of course you've got the old um, texts of the, the Torah, the, the, the Old Testament, um, um, but uh, you know a lot of the commentary of those stories um, by the very uh, famous uh, rabbis um, the, those commentaries are part, you know, the Mishnah is, is those, you know, sort of the, the wisdom of Judaism, I think, is, is not only in the original text, but also in the, in the interpretations that have come subsequently. But I really couldn't tell you. I mean, you know, I can tell you something a little bit about, you know, the festivals, but I'm, I'm just not, uh, I'm not that connected no, with... No. with, with that, that also shouldn't get lost, because I'm sure there are good things there. Look, whatever the wisdom is, what, what is? I mean, I think it's just a, a kind of an essence of a lot of things which people have gone through. The culture has picked up over time and they've put it down into few words. I, think I should not get lost because I think, look, the problem is that, I, like say in India, I mean, those texts that we talk about are in a language we can't read. So right. definitely that aspect is going to get lost. I see even in Islam, so many countries, they, of course, they are Muslim countries, but those people don't understand Arabic. So they, of course, rely on interpretations. So I, so I think that part of it, with the language going, I think a lot of things will definitely go. And then you'll only be left with certain interpretations by people. So yes. I think that, so that I, I should... Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And then that's actually why it's it's kind of, you know, one of the things that's amazing about Israel is that um, Hebrew um, was, you know, a defunct uh, language for, I think, about 2000 years until um, Eliezer ben Yehuda um, revived um, the language by uh, sort of studying the ancient texts and then only communicating with his uh, wife and, and children in, um, in ancient Hebrew. And that's how uh, the uh, the Hebrew language came back into being, so it's 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 actually I think a very rare example of a dead language coming back into everyday usage. And um, you know I, I learned Hebrew at, at my secondary school in London, and I'm sad to say that I I'm not really conversant in it. I can read it and I can understand some, but my speaking and and certainly writing is at a very low level. Um, but uh, I, I believe that you know the the, the sort of the, the real wisdom of of Judaism is is um, um, is in you know sort of teachings of of, of love, 
Um, and, um, you know, and, and I think there's a very strong theme of, of justice in, in the text, from what I understand. Um, and, um, you know, of course, you know, we, we know the Ten Commandments. Um, so, you know, sort of starting, you know, to, uh, you know, put in place some kind of, you know, what people call, you know, Judeo-Christian, you know, morals or, you know, a ways of, of, of ordering uh, society. So I think that Judaism's in, uh, influence on, on the modern world is, is quite significant. Um, and it's something that I, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, I will uh, um, get to know much more. Um, but uh, right now, um, I haven't, and recently, I haven't been uh, reading those kinds of texts. No, of course, with a person like you, who would obviously, who's been traveling all around and has been part of those places, those conversations that you might have with people there and you pick up, look, it's not picking up the religious text. I'm not saying that you have to pick up the religious text and you can repeat that. The fact is, the good things that they say and what you'll hear from people when you live there, those conversations, then you go somewhere else and you talk about it and find out there is that universal kind of a language of, like you said, love or, or whatever mm -hmm. other things, which will be common, which will be common everywhere. So you'll find out when you have those conversations, they'll say, okay, this is exactly what we've been told and this is what our text says. And so that some common link, I think you'll have to do, Ilan, you're the, you're the cultural, cross-cultural person. You have mm -hmm. to start doing that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great um, point. And, and, you know, I, I can tell you that being a Jewish, you know, British, Israeli person living in China, I mean, uh, some people say that, you know, China is, is the only pro-Semitic uh, country in the world because uh, Chinese people uh, seem to have a, a very high um, uh, sort of uh, um, 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 uh, appreciation of uh, Jewish culture. Um, and uh, I think as well, uh, the Chinese government, as far as I can tell, is, is you know trying to uh, in its in its relations with with Israel, trying to convey the the point that that the, the Jewish culture and Chinese culture have a lot of commonalities. Um, so very long civilizations, um, a, a great emphasis on family ties, um, on education. Um, and, um, and so, uh, yeah, that's something that comes through very strongly. I think both the Chinese and Israeli governments are trying to uh, use those maybe cultural commonalities to uh, build um, diplomatic relations between the two countries, which have only been going since 1992, by the way. Um, um, so I believe that Israel might have been the first country in the Middle East to recognize the People's Republic of China, but uh, um, formal diplomatic relations between the two countries were not established um, from between 1949 until 1992, so quite a long period of time. Um, so yes, and actually there's, there's other stories as well, so such as, um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the city of Shanghai became uh, during the Second World War became um, a place where quite a few thousand um, Jewish refugees uh, fleeing the Holocaust in, in Europe uh, went to, to flee. Um, and so Shanghai has quite a rich um, Jewish history to it, which I lived in Shanghai in, uh, from late 2018 to early 2020, um, which was a wonderful experience. And I got to know some of that history, which is, I think is something that a lot of Jewish people really have no idea about, which is kind of a shame, but, um, you know, so um, there was some uh, Jewish uh, community even before those refugees arrived. Um, so for instance, uh, some very well-known Jewish families that were, had emigrated from Iraq. Um, uh, so like the Sassoons, 
um, um, and maybe you know one or two other very sort of well known and very wealthy Jewish families that, that got wealth through, through trading along the Silk Road, the ancient Silk Road. Um, they were living in uh, Shanghai, and actually they built they built many quite imposing uh, buildings on on the banks of the Huangpu River in in Shanghai. But but then when the Second World War and, and the Holocaust um, really kind of um, start got going. Um, there was a Chinese uh, um, diplomatic um, official uh, based in Vienna, who I believe his name was Ho Feng Shan. Um, and of course, you have to remember that this is before the People's Republic of China became a nation. So it was actually, it was the, the Republic of China, the, um, the, the Nationalist uh, Party, which is now, um, you know, more, um, they're based in, in Taiwan. Um, one of their, uh, you know, sort of um, consuls um, approved, uh, gave a lot of thousands of visas to uh, refugees in, in Austria to be able to leave, um, you know, from, uh, they got, you know, I think transport, you know, maybe to Italy, and then they took boats to, and they, you know, what, what was going on was that Shanghai was, uh, if you kind of, you know, know anything about um, that, history, you know, kind of boom town in the 1930s and, and, and 40s, although, of course, it was it was invaded, you know, by the Japanese, of course. Um, and it was one of the only places in the world where you actually didn't need a visa to arrive and to 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 be able to live there. So the, I think those visas that were issued by that um, Chinese consul in, in Vienna were papers to leave Austria. Um, and so um, and so, yeah, so, so I think about 20, 25,000 Jews managed to survive um, because of that one guy. And, and so the Chinese government today likes to talk about that story, even though um, it, it obviously the People's different. Republic was not even... Yeah, it was a different time, but yes, it's, yeah. it's good for them. Yeah. No, but, but, yeah. but, but I'm just saying, thinking that in terms of conversations on religion and everything, I mean, I'm just thinking that why, why do people have to, I mean, if you talk about what the Quran says or the Gita says or the Bible says, they can just be conversations on any kind of literature. Well, why does it have to become a religious thing? I just have to, I don't have to understand that. A good thing written anywhere is a good thing written by anyone. So you can, we should be able to read. So, but those conversations don't happen. So we don't get to know a lot of good things that are written there because yeah. it becomes a taboo subject. Oh, we won't talk about it. This is Islam <laughs> oh, or this oh, is no. Hinduism. <laughs> right, right. I'm not, you know, I like that at all. I mean, I think that all ancient uh, religious traditions um, have something to offer the world. I mean, perhaps there's, there's some bad things in there as well, but um, uh, we should, we should appreciate them for the good and the bad and, and look at how, where they came from and how they developed and, and how they can help us to understand the world that we currently live in. Because yeah. I think we are still living under the influence of those traditions of, you know, two, three, four thousand uh, years ago. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm still, uh, yeah. so I'm still and thinking that when does it become a religion? It's okay. I write a nice book. And then some people say, I, we want to control whatever is written in that book. And only some people are, will be people who can read it and follow it. Everyone else is not allowed to do it. When does that happen? Yeah, it's just a book. It's just a book. Yeah. But that happens, I think, when humans are thrown into the mix. Um, <laughs> the book, I think, doesn't do it on its own, as far as I know. That's what um, I'm <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, I think this is kind of classic in-group, out-group um, social psychology, um, which is very relevant to conflict resolution, of course. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that we should, if we come from a specific religious tradition, then we should be very open about um, understanding other um, religious traditions. I think that religion is a, is a wonderful thing on a personal or a community level, but we should also accept that religion as a concept has been used to do lots of, of really terrible things in human history. And so we need to be very aware of that. And so we need to not allow people to be divided. I mean, anything, you know, I think religion, like any kind of major concept like politics or, 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 or something like that has a great power to unite 
but also a great power to divide. And so we need to focus on how we can be united and not how we can be divided. No, but the way I'm looking at it is that, of course, religion does that. But I'm saying that it was not, didn't start off as religion. It started off as certain teachings could be written or not written. We don't know. Because obviously in Hinduism, there's no concept of really religion as such. People, like they say, it's a way of life. So that is the way it should have been for all these things. It's just a way of life and any, anyone can follow it. I, if, if, if I follow something written in a book, I don't have to be branded something. I just pick up the nice things that I want to follow. So I think that's why I'm saying these conversations are important that you will break this whole, I don't know, let's, I don't know what you call, want to call them, but just a control that people have taken over certain things and ideologies and with text and everything. I think we just have to break it by having conversations about it. Yes, um, definitely. I mean, I think, and, and there's a lot of, I think, good work going on in, in interfaith dialogue. Um, actually, I met a um, really wonderful person um, who uh, has a PhD in uh, conflict resolution, and he was sort of like a mentor for me um, in terms of me, you know, thinking about how I can develop myself in the field of conflict resolution. And he wrote his PhD thesis on interfaith dialogue. Um, I think sort of specifically using, you know, maybe the Holocaust as, as some kind of, um, you know, some kind of criteria of, of how he, uh, you know, how he uh, does his analysis. Um, and so it's not, it's not something that is, I, I know much about at all, um, but I know that there's a lot of uh, good work going on by people who specialize in this area. And I think also in Israel and Palestine, um, is something that uh, is very important because, you know, people in Israel, it's a majority Jewish country um, and, uh, you know, obviously um, uh, has a large uh, Muslim population in Israel. And of course, you know, uh, in Palestine, uh, the majority of, of people are, are Muslim as well. So it's important, although, although I would say that that's not the main issue of, of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. I, I don't think it's, it's, it's a, you know, some people sort of, you know, characterize it as a battle between Judaism and Islam. I, it's not like that at all. It's, I think it's more that, 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 that religion just sort of uh, informs different ways of, of, of living your life, like different ways of praying and um, different, you know, rituals and uh, different ways of communicating and, and, um, and, and seeing the world, you know, we all see the world through the cultural lenses that we've uh, learned in, in our journey thus far. And so, yeah, but, but, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is really a perfect storm. It has so many different aspects to it. Um, you know, ethnicity, uh, uh, you know, different parts of identity, ethnic identity, religious identity. Uh, it's about resources, about land, about sovereignty, um, you know, about, um, you know, demographics and population growth. And it's, it's really a perfect storm. And that's probably why it's gone on for, you know, quite a, quite a number of decades. But, but I, I re always remain hopeful um, and I believe that there's going to be some good things happening, I would say, you know, in the next uh, few years or five to 10 years that, uh, that, that people can come together. I mean, the problem now is that the, 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 the Israelis and the Palestinians have, have been living separate lives for so long that they just, they don't understand each other. And they also are very suspicious of, of each other. And they both think that you know, they all want to get rid of the other group. And that's why that it's so difficult to resolve that particular conflict. Um, but that was actually one of the main reasons that I went to do my master's degree in Israel, because I wanted to understand it on a deeper level. And I wanted to, you know, uh, be somebody who, if I have opinion about it, it's an opinion that is based on my lived experience of going to Israel, going to Palestine, meeting people from uh, the, the, uh, the region and understanding their lives, their perspectives, their narratives, and how those perspectives and narratives can be brought together to create a, a situation where violence is not a regular factor. But one thing, look, it serves some people's purpose. And yeah. that, that is where the issue is, that whole concept of that fear, creating a fear and everything. 
but i don't know whether you heard that ape kwadan was there on one of the shows and he was talking about him in australia and this he said he's he's a palestinian with he was with a jew jew there and he told the media person cover us we are friends and they didn't want to cover them so i mean that's the good things are never going to be out there but i think that, like i said finally i don't know i keep saying conversations 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 i think that fear and everything that has been built into people's mind it has to just go away i think yes look we we made this world and we can change this world there's no doubt about it you know one of the things that the is i find so strange and that i find very frustrating is that people who i know very well smart people very high well educated um you know they always tell me ah oh, it's impossible we'll never make peace with the palestinians we'll never do it and i always say but that's what we said about the arabs before we had peace agreements with the egyptians and the jordanians and now several other countries um so i don't understand what it is about the human psyche and i i i i i've not studied i i did social psychology as part of my master's degree but i've not studied psychology as a as a subject on its own you know i just don't understand why people can be so pessimistic i mean we can absolutely change the dynamic but it takes real effort first of all it takes you need to recognize that something needs to be changed to start with so that's why you know i after doing my master's degree um i go around shouting from the rooftops that we can change this dynamic it is possible and it will happen and we just need to get behind this idea that people are all people and everybody basically wants and needs the same things and that one day there will be peace i mean sure it's about vested interest but you know like so for instance you know one thing that really frustrates me about the world is that you know we seem to very much accept the concept of profiting from war right this big private arms companies they make all these weapons you know if you make all these weapons you got to use these weapons that is the nature of capitalism i mean if you you know if 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 you want to you know if that's the way that the system works then <laughs> i think we we we've done something very silly in making war a profitable enterprise i mean why don't we try making or at least recognizing that peace could be a much more profitable enterprise than war but you know it's funny like a lot of the professional opportunities that i look at in the sort of fields of peace building and conflict resolution and certainly mediation i mean you know try getting paid as a community mediator even in a place like the uk you have to work as a volunteer you know i work as a community mediator i go or and also as a civil mediator i go i sit between people you know a few hours later the you know the problem is is basically there's an agreement um and it takes away you know resources from the police from the local government from the taxpayer of course who pay for those services but i have to work for free and yet those companies that make those nuclear weapons that make those ships that make those planes that make those guns they make huge huge profits. huge, huge amounts of money why do we keep expecting that we'll live in a peaceful world when we keep accepting our governments and our private industries making huge profits from war it doesn't make any sense and i'm going to use the rest of my life to uh make the case for the biz- the business case apart from the logical and the and the moral case the business case of living in peace yeah but i think the, it all starts with the very basic thing you basically vote in a government and that government decides decides on purchasing arms is the government which decides now obviously there are people who are going to create those differences and conflicts and everything so that there is a need for those arms so obviously that linkage we, there is a different level that is happening and so this whole th- thing just gets escalated as it goes along because obviously 
the governments need money for their own funding they, 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 the people in the government need they, they have that need so as a society first of all when you make money important all those things are definitely going to happen with individuals they're finally individuals it's not like it's not like a government has been thrown in or people are just branded as some community they're all people inside that and those basic things as a society that we have created is going to be applicable to all of them so i think we we have to change maybe the society that we live in and the values and the morals that should be around i think we have to start spreading that because hitting them there it will be the most difficult thing to do i mean these are yeah. people who who actually whatever way they monopolized on a lot of things and they maybe create the narrative they feed the narrative so i think to be getting into that is a very 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 large kind of thing but if it's a smaller part the community part i think that is where it all will have to start yeah sure and i tell you what the experience as i've had um doing community mediation um you know even though i i haven't been paid for them but you know i find them so meaningful and it's 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 a really incredible feeling to see people go through that transformation of literally you know being very angry and frustrated and even hating somebody not wanting to look at them even uh, not wanting to speak to them and then to walk away after only a few hours of having uh, uh, even sometimes a written agreement where they 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 will that, that determines how they that they will communicate with each other respectfully and that they will collaborate on you know various issues like noise and throwing their rubbish away and you know the boundaries of the the homes and everything you know the skills that i learned on my master's degree have huge value in not only the field of conflict resolution and mediation specifically but in every aspect of our lives and we need to bring these skills into everything i'm talking government at all levels international relations um you know people to pe- any any exchange that that involves people can benefit from somebody who's been trained in conflict resolution and mediation who's got those excellent communication skills can sit between two people and listen you know we too often you know i think this world is is too much about speaking and 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 having your opinion we really need to get into the habit um and and certainly i think that people should bring mediators into many different conversations any any conversation where there's going to be people who disagree which is basically every conversation mm-hmm. have somebody who has those skills to be able to take that conversation and put it on a uh, a respectful and a civil and a collaborative footing i mean we will live in a much better world if we start recognizing the value of these skills listen. value yeah exactly and, understanding yeah. the value and this is where you what you said about a mediator and a community mediator has to do it for free the whole value by itself mediation and free have got linked in most yeah. places most places so where does a person find value for something that he's in a, in a community pays nothing for it and then if you say when he's in an organization he needs to pay for it he just doesn't understand why where is the right. he doesn't understand the value i think first of all you have to change that but how do we change that well oh. good good question i i you know i actually i did a case in shanghai recently that that um was when i lived out there i you know told everybody that i was trained in mediation and i got contacted by a european lady who said um some people that she knows are having a problem in their relationship and they you know looking to break up and they wanted a mediator to take them take them through that that journey and it all kind of somebody had called the police and it all got them very um you know uh sort of um you know rank um uh, fr- um fractious um and um you know it uh, i i met with both parties um um and um you know discussed the situation with both of them and in the end they they didn't want to have a joint meeting where it, i did it via zoom of course because i'm not based in shanghai right now um but uh, they didn't want to have a joint meeting and actually the 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 guy in in the relationship um you know he he his view was that he didn't want to have a joint meeting 
Um, and originally the woman did, but then she changed her mind and she did, you know, no, I, I don't need this and I'll, I'll just walk away. And, you know, she just didn't want to take part. So I spoke to the guy afterwards and, um, you know, I, I, I said, you know, I'd be interested to hear your feedback on how the process went and if you felt that I was helpful at all in, 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 in the mediation process. And he said, what mediation process? And I said, well, we, we, we had these meetings and I spoke to both of you and, you know, we decided or it, that you and your partner decided that you didn't want to have a joint meeting. So he even, he got the outcome that he actually wanted, but he didn't recognize the value of what I had done. Um, and so that was, well, I mean, you know, I would say frustrating, but it, it actually didn't matter to me because, you know, they both basically walked away happy. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's meaningful for me that I helped them, you know, I mean, literally like the police got involved and, uh, you know, that's, that's often I find that, you know, mediators come in, right? Like if the police have been called or if somebody's got a lawyer involved or we're like, you know, we're like the, you know, international rescue, right? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just crazy. It's like, get us in early and then you won't have those problems later on. You know, don't wait to have this big dispute that's been going on for one or two or more years. It's, it's madness. You know, you can have somebody who can resolve your problem uh, very quickly, very cost effectively and confidentially. You don't have to tell anybody about it. Do it early. If you feel that, you know, somebody has a different opinion and you just can't understand it, get a mediator in. That person can facilitate a meeting and then it won't blow up in the future. So, so Ilan, the question is, yeah. how do we change that? How do people understand the value of it? How do we spread the word? That is the important well, I, part. Well, I hope I'm helping to do that right now. And, and I obviously think that you're doing an excellent job of, of getting the, the message out there. I mean, I'm really encouraged, actually. I mean, there's so many people coming through. There's all of these master's programs like mine at Tel Aviv University, giving people these skills. Um, and the world really needs it. So how do we do it? Well, I don't know. I mean, we have to keep having the conversations. I think it's um, it's a case of, uh, and I think we, we spoke about this recently, people don't like, so there are many different things, but people don't like to admit that they have a problem. They don't like to admit that they're in a conflict. Everybody's got different styles. Some people might consider it just natural kind of competition. They like, you know, the, you know, let's, we'll have different opinions. And, you know, certainly in Israel, the way of communication is very direct. Um, and, and, um, and, and that might be one of the reasons why, uh, you know, people who don't like that can, can get offended by that form of communication. So, the, the point I wanted to make is, is that, um, you know, some people are conflict avoiders, you know, they think that by not talking about it, that that will help the problem go away. So what we need to do is we need to say that it's not about when there's a big conflict, when there's a big dispute, it's about recognizing that we all have our different opinions, we have different ways of working, um, and that these will cause us to have, to feel, uh, you know, different emotions. And that we need to recognize the value of that. Conflict can be very uh, good in terms of innovation, right? You get, you know, if you have conflict, if you manage that well, you can actually get great ideas that come out of that process. So we need to stop thinking about conflict as something that is always bad. Um, and that if you, you know, avoid it, um, or if the, you know, you feel it's like really something to be, you know, competitive, like I'll win the conflict, you know, I'll beat you, I'll, I'll win the argument, I'm right, you're wrong. We need to really move away from that and to think that conflict can be something which is actually a wonderful thing if it's just managed in the right way. And the way to manage it is to get somebody um, or to learn yourself about how to actually manage conflict. But, but the way I'm looking at it is that I think what is happening is that mediators have conversations with mediators and they have discussed all the nice technical things and everything. No one I think is actually talking to the user. 
and the user experience is what finally matters and if they're using it what benefits they've got and if they're not using it do they even know what it's about i mean we keep talking about the uk being a um, oh, quite a mature market in terms of mediation as we understand but obviously there is no people don't have work mediators don't have work and it's very sad to see them frustrated they get frustrated okay i've done this i've done that and i'm trying my things maybe if some community thing might come up and they think okay i'm getting some experience when i might as well do it so the chain keeps happening because there are obviously new people being churned out and they think that okay let's get that experience so but finally is anyone talking to the user are we uh, because i look conversations that i have with the users they seem very interested there is enough work out there to be done yeah but, sure Yeah I think that's right we we have to stop talking to ourselves and and I do I mean I I'm quite active in posting about things uh to you know just obviously my general network and having conversations with family and friends and professional like contacts I now I I talk a lot to my professional network in China about how conflict resolution because actually the, the concept of conflict resolution is I think not as developed in 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 mainland China um as it is in in other parts of so Singapore Hong Kong you know, UK USA um even even you know I think India is is quite far along in in, in is it in what well, income in comparison to to China i i think um you know just from what i understand and and a friend of mine um a really lovely lady who um is sort of in the tech startup space i met her in you know she's chinese when uh, i was living in israel and she she just got in touch with me one day she said elan can you just explain more about you know what is conflict resolution and mediation and she after i explained it to her she was like i think there's a huge potential in china in the future i mean exactly. 1.4 billion people the legal system is just not going to keep up with the amount of disputes that gets filed at court um obviously there's a huge uh, need in terms of cross border business um and you know workplace mediation in china is going to be a huge thing and that's basically how i'm trying to position myself as somebody who has an educational background in china and the broader east asian region um who has lived in china and who speaks mandarin i'm trying to position myself as somebody who you know could be you know working perhaps with a chinese mediator to you know give the sort of the eastern and the western perspective on conflict and to build teams and and i would say as well that mediation i th- i would say almost always should be done in a co-mediation model because even when you have two parties and it's and it's maybe a relatively straightforward case it's still so much easier to keep track of what is going on you can you, you only have two eyes and you have to be looking in the same direction so you can only look at one person at one time so if it's even if it's a two party dispute and certainly if it's a multi party dispute it should be done co-mediation and the mediators should come from different backgrounds you know maybe one can be a legal background and the other one non-legal background i of course come from the non-legal more kind of policy uh, school uh, background you know in the in the political context of of conflict um but you know i would like to see you know people you know inviting others to take part in their mediations i mean let's help each other to get this uh profession uh out there and with more people having experience who can then build their own practices and then once more people are out there talking to other people about it they we can multiply the amount of of work that's coming to wow so just ex- said exactly what i'm trying to do this this is exactly yeah. what i'm trying to do so perfect elan this is the way you have to go but the only thing is that finding the right people and being comfortable with them co-mediation not that, that simple i mean there is you have to have that comfort level going and it will happen with few it will happen with a few at least with, with those few you can start i mean exploring the concept and the, i mean there i'm going to me there's enough work to be done is just you know, that uh, yeah okay i mean look, that is a good point but i've i've done i so i i'm doing right now i'm doing community mediation in england i'm doing civil mediation in scotland and you know just whatever else comes in my network commercial or sort of workplace i did a little bit of workplace when i was living in in shanghai actually i did those on my own um and the civil cases and the communi- community cases i always do co-mediation and 
I always work with somebody I don't know, but you know, I can get to know them. Um, I trust that the organization has hired people who are going to be responsible and who are going to be, uh, you know, thoughtful about, you know, working with somebody. Okay, sure, you need to get to know somebody, but you, you're not just going to pull somebody off the street. You know, maybe it can be somebody who's recommended to you, but you know, let's let's have some people who, you know, aren't those sort of very high-profile mediators who have plenty of work to do and let's spread it around just a little bit so that other people can go off and, and use those experiences to then build you know the the profession um so yes i mean you do need to know the person that you're mediating with but really anybody who i think has been serious about the field of conflict resolution and has gone down a path for a certain number of years will be somebody who you can work with. You just need to know them before you step in the room with them, which is in the era of Zoom is very easy these days. I would also like to mention that, you know, I do a lot of training of students and other kind of professionals in mediation skills. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, th th there is, th those I think are where the paid um, opportunities are. Uh, to do training. And I think um, they're very meaningful because they help me to keep my skills sharp to, to meet the graduate students each year. And to, for, to you know, I, because I do this each year at Tel Aviv University and I, I make sure that each year that I do that mediation workshop at Tel Aviv University, which is an amazing experience, I bring something new to the table. And this year, we, we just finished it about a month ago. We did it via Zoom. What I brought to the table was recent experience of online mediation via Zoom. So, of course, the students, we taught them over Zoom. So, of course, they wanted to know how does mediation go via Zoom. So that's what I brought to the training table. So I, you know, constantly thinking about how I can develop myself. But what happens to those people after you've done the training? What are they, they doing? They finish their master's degree and they go into various different professions, uh, government, military, you know, we always have some. Okay, so this is just a skill they take with them in the other work that they're doing. Not yeah, some of them might, you know, go on to become mediators, of course, but uh, probably quite a small number. That's right, because I really want to know if you, when you've trained someone and then they must have come back to you with their feedback as to what their experiences as being a mediator has been. Has that happened? Has someone given you feedback um, on that? Yes, a little bit. I mean, one of, because I meet, I meet the students each year. So one of the students from a few years ago, she said that you know, she had a case uh, or a couple of cases that she'd been approached to do. And she asked for my advice in terms of how to set the process up. And yeah, I'm more than happy. I mean, in terms of feedback, I mean, I'd say that not that many of the students that I've trained I know of have done, you know, I'm just trying to think, but, but yeah, probably, you know, she was one. In terms of the feedback, I mean, I think we spoke before the mediations took place. So it would be, I, I don't think she told me how they went, um, but uh, yeah, so maybe I, I can't really answer your, your question, unfortunately, but, but, you know, I meet, 30, 40 uh, master students each year at Tel Aviv University, and they all go off to do really wonderful things. And eventually they're going to be approached to do mediation. So, and I tell you what, they all are very, very, they love the mediation workshop. Um, we get really high um, appraisals from the students each year. Uh, it's like the most enjoyable part of the master's program for them. And they really feel that it gives them tangible skills, at least, you know, if not actually to do pure mediation work, then to bring into their professional lives, which of course I think is, is critical. I mean, these skills of listening and reflective listening and empathy and, um, and, and, you know, sort of, you know, neutral language, how to phrase a question in neutral. These are going to really help you in any single job that you do in your life. But what about those people whom I want to identify with the mediator mindset? How many have you identified out of the people you've taught? Yeah, okay. So it's you can see within the cohort of between 30 and 40 students, I mean, uh, you will have, you know, let's say around 
five, you know, maybe between sort of like three and five students, you'll be like, okay, right. They get it. They know, you know, they have this sort of like natural ability. Yes, I remember yes that's one, the one. Yeah. <laughs> one guy who was quite young, he, he actually came from Yale University, I think, you know, that was his undergrad. And he had trained in um, hypnotherapy. And he was brilliant at it because he knew how to make people sort of follow his cues. You know, he he trained in that. So he just took to mediation like, you know, a, what would you say, like a duck to, to water or whatever. Um, he just, he just knew, and I, I actually, I saw him, he just repeated, he just said something and one of the parties just repeated what he said. And I was like, Oh my god! <laughs> so, well, you have to you have to learn from him now. <laughs> seriously, no, honestly, that's why it's great to be one of the trainers on the workshop because we learn from the students. Of course, I mean they come from all over the world and from really interesting backgrounds. So it's one of, but that was you know quite a, a nice surprise because he was quite young and um, but you know smart smart guy and and he just happened to have done this sort of hypnotherapy uh, course. So yeah, you know, those verbal techniques can be very useful for a media. So, and then, you know, then you've got sort of like, you know, 10 or 20 more who are like, I love this, but you know, I found it difficult. A lot of the people who do the master's program come from legal backgrounds, of course, and they, they want to focus on the, the, you know, the conflict resolution and mediation in a, in a political context. And they actually, and I'm sure you know this, they actually struggle a little bit. Like there's always, you know, maybe like five people on the course who have law degrees and they just, they find it really difficult to get out of the, 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 the directive mindset where they're, they're immediately thinking, this is this person's case, this is that person's case, you know, I know what, what's gonna, and they, they, just, they just find it, it's just so foreign to them, you know, that what they've learned how to do in, in their undergraduate degrees, um, so they might struggle, but if, you know, I'm sure that they, if they get their head around it, they can, you know, implement, you know, so you could have your lawyer hat or your lawyer mindset and your mediator mindset. And if you can switch quite easily between them, then you can be quite effective. Um, and then, you know, there's some students, maybe of a small number who just kind of, you know, I don't think that I'm not interested in mediation and I'm going to do other things in my career. But, but Ilan, we have to identify people with the mediator mindset in large numbers. So what is it that if you have to send out a communication out into a community and you want to tell them how to identify a person with a mediator mindset, what is the communication you're going to send out? What are we going to write to them? What is the, what are they have to, what do they have to look out for? Um, I think, you know, good listeners, people who, enjoy listening right that, that is the critical skill and then the other stuff you can kind of learn but you have to be able to sit there in silence and take things in it's not as e it's not as easy but us listening yeah no problem i can do listening no it's really difficult to you know because actually one of the really difficult skills of being a mediation trainer is that the students want to know what it was that they said that was effective mm -hmm and what it was that they said that was less effective. So when you're training, and especially it was a challenge over Zoom, you've got to like focus in, like you know, laser focus on every single word they're saying. And it's really draining. So people who enjoy listening, people who think, oh yeah, I'm a good listener. I love listening to people and their problems. That is the start of somebody who you could say has the mediator mindset. People who are natural, empathizers, people who can literally just put their mind in somebody else's mind and say, you know, I, I'm trying to understand how this is feeling for you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, people who can do that. And, and I think, again, that's not an easy skill to be able to empathize is really a very undervalued, underrated skill in our world today. Um, and so, yeah, that's another one. And then other things like I think, you know, being calm, you know, being calm and patient, right? People, they want their opportunity to vent. They want their opportunity to go through every little aspect of the conflict. Oh, but then you said this on this date. And then, oh, but then you did this where you, uh, you know, you were banging on my wall and it made me really angry. And, you know, they, they have to have that, certainly at the beginning of the mediation, 
the opportunity to vent, to get those emotions off their chest. So the mediator has to be patient and calm because also the parties can try to manipulate the mediator. So you have to be able to remain calm, you know, be, uh, remain loyal to the process um, and uh, to being neutral, you know, being uh, impartial unbiased, these are not easy things to do. We all have automatic things in our brains that we don't even know is happening, heuristics, where you hear something and immediately you're like, oh God, oh, I hate that. Or did that person just say, oh no, that's horrible. You know, but you have to be quiet and to, you know, so I think actually I, I meditate, by the way, I'm not like super, you know, I don't know all of the, um, the, 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 the philosophy of, of meditation, but, I, on an almost daily basis, will take between certainly five minutes, maybe up to 40 minutes to just sit. You know, it's wonderful being here in Como. I can sit and watch the sun go down. Just closing my eyes, focusing on my breathing. I think people who uh, appreciate meditation as something that we should be doing in our daily lives, you know, that could be somebody as well. I mean, you don't need to meditate. I to do, uh, yeah, but I'm making it easier. All I'm saying is I'm telling communities or even now with this children in school, whom do you think in your school or in your community is someone that people go to to resolve their disputes? The person is identified. We don't have even have to tell them what traits to look out for. They're brain born. It's like natural in the whole concept. So I'm making it that easy. Yes. And, and it's funny, you know, it's funny that I came to this profession because I think actually in many different situations in my uh, early life, um, I was always seen as that person who could sort of speak for other people or, or who, who could be the middle man. Um, um, and I, I'm the youngest in my family, by the way, I have three older siblings. Um, who are actually quite a lot older because they're from my dad's uh, first marriage. They're, they're half siblings. And, um, you know, so I was the youngest. So, uh, you know, the, my, my mom tells me this funny story of when I was kind of like um, a baby and, you know, my older, my eldest brother, who's 10 years older than me, he came down the stairs and into the kitchen and he shouted at everybody, he said, who's been touching my records? And I went, I did. <laughs> and after that, he he couldn't say anything because I was the youngest. And you know, what what can he say to you know to a to a very uh, to a very young uh, child? So um, I think you know, yeah, I've always been the person actually that's been honest and owning up to my my you know my faults um, and and uh, being honest and open. I th I think that's really a critical. Uh, characteristic of a mediator that you are a genuine person you're not there to solve the problem you're there to guide the conversation to a place where they can solve their problem and so being genuine and and being honest about not knowing how to solve somebody else's problem that um and, and also i would like to say being humble uh you know knowing your um, uh, your weak points is something that's really important to bring to mediation. That's what I said. All these things, when you find out that the community has identified someone, when you dissect, dissect the person, you'll find all that. You'll find all that. But to say that, okay, go out looking for these, these, these things is never going to happen. Because, I mean, it's very difficult for people also to pinpoint onto a trait in that sense. Okay, this person has that, that person doesn't have that. I think it's just going to be a natural thing. So how, how are you going to identify some? You have to identify a thousand people, Ilan. Okay. I have, I have to identify a thousand. You have to identify a thousand. And the thousand can get to a million. Thousand <laughs> into thousand, yeah, it's very easy. Yeah. So are you... Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, I, I already train mediators, so... No, but no, out of that, you have to identify the ones with the mediator mindset, and then we have to get them work. First of all, we have to get them work also. Absolutely. So that, but there's no use getting get work, getting work if you don't have the right people. Yes, and actually, so I, I, I wanted to mention as well, just rewinding a little bit, that, so as I said, people don't like to admit that they have a problem that they can't solve, that they need to bring somebody else in to solve. So I think we need to be better at communicating the value of mediation in terms of 
how broad it can be for you know for, for, for people so literally I think it's it's a it's a case of asking people to have somebody to come in to help them with a difficult conversation or even I, I know uh, an Israeli mediator um, Orit a lovely lady um, she she wrote an article about how the uh, agreement, the Abraham agreements that were signed between Israel and the UAE and Qatar um, and um, which is the other country, I can't remember now. Um, um, there was also Sudan, um, um, I've forgotten one country. Um, uh, so how, you know, that was sort of akin to, we, we, should, we should think about mediation as being a process that can enhance dialogue between people. It's not about it's not about separating people who hate each other um, or, or, or bringing together people who hate each other. It should it, it's about facilitating productive conversations. And I'm sure every single person in business, in their personal life, um, in, in every single facet of their professional life, they need help. Um, because we know this, because people end up in conflicts. So if we can just change the dynamic to it being about enhancing communication and doing it early rather than later on, we will have more work and we will prevent things from going to a lawyer, you know, going to war, going to physical violence, um, we can we can prevent a lot of these things. And yeah, I mean, you know, we need to do that very urgently. This is, but this is what, I'm, what I've been talking about, that developing that culture of mediation. And that culture of mediation has to start from schools. The children have to understand there is a process like this. Everything is not about authority doing things for you. You yeah. yourself can do things for yourself. So we have to start there, Ilan. How are we doing that? How are you going to be helping in that? Yeah, good question. And, and I think you're right. It, it should start at that level. Um, I mean, I, I am sort of a little bit connected with people who are trying to introduce uh, the, the concept of, of peace education and conflict resolution for young people. It's not something that I'm directly involved in, but I'm watching it closely and I hope that I can get involved in that because it is absolutely, if we start with the younger people, then you know, by the time they uh, become adults, then they will have the skills uh, to be able to resolve their own conflict. And I think that but, is... The no, I don't know the difference is that to do. Because you've been talking about conflict resolution and I am so focused only on dispute resolution. Because yeah. I think that that is something which is quantifiable, that some resolution has happened. And that way, at least the value comes in. There's a value. Because conflict resolution is a, is a much larger area and there's lots that does a person even understand that the conflict has been resolved. <laughs> we don't even know. <laughs> so I think dispute resolution is what I'm focusing on. Yes. I mean, look, I understand the, the subtleties and the nuance between uh, conflict resolution and dispute resolution. But essentially, I think that uh, even, even that, I mean, that's what I think we should recognize that a conflict is something and I think you know engineers and, and mathematicians probably understand this is is just something where is something is not matching um, it's not matching or it's different or it's um, it's 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 unbalanced um, and uh, we I think can apply the term conflict resolution to perhaps be an umbrella term to mean when two people are or two or more people are, are in disagreement. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, no, that's it's what I'm a, saying. No, no, you are going to you are going to do that larger thing. You are going to do the conflict resolution in the world. But for me, with me, that you that little subset of dispute resolution is what you are going to be working on, because that larger area, it's. It, I mean, once you've gone through the whole culture of mediation and developed that, then that aspect will definitely get covered as you go along. But yeah. to get the value. To, for people to perceive a value in that whole process will have to happen with dispute resolution is the way I'm looking at it. Because otherwise, it becomes such a larger theoretical concept to discuss where the whole value of something happening with it is lost. 
So yeah. this is this can you can see in front of you. Okay, you did this. This was where the dispute was, and now this got resolved. And yes, there is a value of the person who helped you do that. So yeah. I, I, that's why I'm concentrating on that part. Okay. And, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, obviously, that larger thing has to happen. People like you have to bring in the larger piece in the world. We need people like you to do that. But with me, just that little dispute resolution, I'm happy with that. No, I understand. It, I think it is definitely a more common term for uh, you know sort of lower level um, you know disputes, of which there are many, of course. Many, and, uh, many, many, many. It's many. definitely much more well known by the public because of perhaps. Uh, you know the the connection with with uh, with with law and 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 and, and litigation. So yeah, I I, look, I totally understand what you're trying to do, and I think it's a good thing. Um, um, but yeah, I mean that's you know. But how are we going to get to the children? How are we going to do that? Well, we we have to lobby the people who decide what the children learn. Um, you going to do that? And, and I think as I tried to demonstrate earlier from my surprise at not knowing about the history of you know, Britain's uh, imperialist uh, history, um, the history of empire, um, we, I think, are not doing such a great job in, in that area um, where we can definitely enlarge a curriculum to, to focus on, on these uh, you know, understanding different cultures, and then, of course, the very tangible skills of dispute resolution um, and and and. Uh, I know the way, no, okay. no, the way I'm looking at it is that the, uh, just a communication to be sent out, telling children that there is a process. To, you don't have to call it mediation. You can whatever you want to the language that you want to use. There's something that helps you re, uh, settle your fight or whatever, whatever simple as simple as you can make it. And is there someone you can identify first? And those people, uh, maybe look. You, you don't have to bring them onto the global scale at all. So there is no global platform they have to come at. They have to do it in the schools itself. So maybe yeah. what we're trying to do is maybe just have that that little communication going out, and they identify the people. They those those people whom we say have a mediator mindset get some identification in the school, saying mm -hmm. that okay, this person is someone that the children in the school think can help them resolve this. So you can go to them. And that process starts. They start talking to them. So they get some help. So something gets resolved. They go into their house. They, they, they tell their parents about it. So mm -hmm. they, they understand, okay, there is something like that that happens. Those parents talk about this in the communities. Look, my child did. I, I goes to a school where this happens. I think this is an interesting thing. Why can't we do it? And then those people in the community are the people in businesses. They are the ones in the government. Those are the people everywhere. It's just, everyone is part of some community. So yeah. if that culture then goes there, I, that's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think what we need to do as part of that process is to very clearly demonstrate the value. And I'm not only talking about a monetary value, although it absolutely will translate into a monetary value, but the value of teaching young people these skills um, in terms of, you know, we've seen in the pandemic with, with children learning at home and being overburdened with study and exams and all of this pressure on social media. We need to show very clearly and empirically how this, these, this education, teaching these, uh, these subjects can help young people to manage not only manage their anxieties and their stresses and develop as young people, um, but also to um, to help them uh, in in their in their development of their professional lives as as well. I mean, I think if you are sort of a calmer person, you are more patient. You're a good listener. Um, if you can empathize, um, if you can you know, word things in a neutral way so that people don't get offended, you are going to be more successful in your life. It's that simple. Oh, the, look, I'm on the totally op opposite side of what you're saying. I'm saying that, first of all, the people whom you identify have the mindset they don't really need to be taught anything. They have it in them. And by teaching them, maybe that whole natural skill that they've got in them, which is maybe unique and maybe takes things in a different direction altogether, maybe you just might limit it by telling them, look, this is the way it's done. Because this is 
people to people interaction there is no right or wrong it's the person being able to handle that situation and we are thrown in with unique people all the time and look this is something that i repeat everywhere i have to keep repeating it that you have so many billion people on the planet and all of them are unique and two unique people have an issue with each other and mm. a third unique person comes in it's a combination no one even knows what it's all about it's just something which will happen as it happens and someone who has a natural ability will be able to handle it as it comes mm. but, but if we try to say look one is what you are talking about a general training of all the nice things that have to happen in the world which is what again let's go back to what we were talking about religion and the texts it was all the nice things that had to happen it's already available to us all available to us but they, it went into a total different direction same thing you will tell people about the nice things which are already available they know what those nice things are but the fact is that at the end of the day those nice people who actually can do good things they get lost in the background because they, they don't really need to know they they know what the nice things are but now we have to use those nice things and those nice people to do nice things and yeah. that opportunity they're not getting so i'm trying to say that let's create that opportunity right at the first stage itself a lot of focus is ha- happens on training 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 and i'm saying that that what what basis do you have to say that this is the way this child who is growing up and someone who might have a totally unique thought on even dispute resolution Mm. might have a unique thought on how it's done and has, does it that way and we program that in a certain manner if that there must be something wrong with the programming that today we still do, don't have the kind of peace that you are looking at there must mm. be some problem somewhere so let the natural ability of all these unique people come out and some good things will come out of it as i see it i'm trying to go away from the whole training concept and instead trying to let them be the way they are and give them a opportunity to use those skills we um, are trying to say that we will you can't develop those skills in someone you just can maybe bring it out maybe right. maybe i don't know how, whether that also comes out the person actually just identifies in that training okay i have this oh yes i do this it's just identifying it but the person has it yeah you i don't know whether you, you can actually create those things in someone i don't i don't know whether you can do that you can you can you can educate them on it okay yeah. there is a skill like this and it is good for you either in a workplace or in your community wherever you are it will always help you yeah it's yeah. a good skill to have and if you and that person will maybe consciously try it and maybe in that kind of a situation that conscious attempt will help them Yes. definitely and they say okay this is a good skill to have but for someone to have it in built and yes. all those things to be moving at the same time you if you have say, you you identified maybe seven skills and those mm-hmm. those seven skills to be playing together you can't do it consciously it mm-hmm. has to happen totally subconsciously so i i i'm just saying let's identify those people who can do it subconsciously they're just doing it and then bring them out and then they can do interesting things in the world yeah sure well i think it's a great idea i mean we should be having conversations with people who are involved in peer mediation um and perhaps we should come together to write a letter to our uh, you know to our sort of ministries of education and you know maybe doing some kind of a pilot with uh, uh selecting you know at least at least two students in each classroom who can be the go to uh, peer mediator yeah, yeah exactly that. that's what i'm saying and the children decide children identify maybe you can create an atmosphere for it yes but right. don't involve yourself in the process because the moment you involve yourself in the process this whole party self determination concept goes away so the children are doing it is for the children by the children of the children they do it themselves and you don't come in i mean yes if, if they want to do it don't stop them from doing it that's the only thing because that this is an alternate kind of a thing when you say alternative dispute resolution now alternative in this case to the authority that the teacher brings in yeah. and definitely that is a that is an option in most kind of cases right. but of course you have to differentiate between things like bullying and all those kind of thing though those matters might, might have to be looked at separately what how it has to happen but basic things i yes. won't re- i won't repeat the other example that i've been repeating everywhere i will i will be, i will not you maybe you can hear it some other time because i keep repeating the same thing everywhere and that one example is something which has told me that yes this is a this is something which is happening out there 
we just have to i, I mean even if we don't even talk about it it's still happening but i will have to repeat it because now that i've said so much about it this was some kids in malaysia that i was talking to and i was telling them that this is exactly what i was telling you just ask them is there someone who does this in your school right and the, and this kid sitting there who was i mean a very small group and this kid tells me that in their class there were some two kids who had to go for some public speaking competition and they couldn't agree on a topic and these two kids co mediation two kids went to those two kids and they actually helped them reach a solution which was a topic which had something from both the topics and those children participated in that competition and they came second in that competition so right there the whole example was in front of me yeah and i'm telling you this is such a small group and look at the number of children in schools i don't i mean in terms of numbers i mean of course in india they're huge yeah, yeah. 250 million children in school Right. If you can get that there, that culture there, the moment they come out, come out, you have 250 million children here who come out. Another 250 million in school, 500 million people, and they're actually obviously connected to their families and community. You can actually change things very fast. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree, and I really hope that uh, you know we can uh, we can make some meaningful change. Obviously. The younger generations are the future, and uh, we need but to. No, keep going no, has, to yeah, but it has to start with you. You're going yeah. to talk to some people who are some children. Can you reach out to some children and ask them? Just talk to them. Yeah. Next time we meet. Next time we meet. Let's get your whatever what whatever feedback you receive. Just talk to them. Some you know, I've been telling everyone on this. Just speak to some children there. and speak to some people who are maybe it could be hr people or whatever and see whether that whole concept of that ombuds have you yeah. have you read whether that such a let's not call it ombuds call it whatever by whatever name some mediator of online kind of a person available all the time yeah. who has no relationship with the hierarchy of the company can right. be available is there an option what is the, is there something that they think can be used not used and then some businesses as to whether they're using mediation why they're not using it if they're not using it do they know about it also i'm telling yeah. you a lot of people don't sure so, oh, yeah absolutely i think it's a very mysterious concept for many people <laughs> no in uk itself i was one of those networking thing that happened in the uk in the uk i was sitting in one of those and you had this little breakout rooms that you have say about five people in that breakout room and i asked one of the person he has some business in some part of england do you know what mediation is said yeah i've heard about it i have no idea what it is but i've heard about it so imagine yeah, again like i said you could talk about it as a mature market but that communication hasn't reached down the ladder and to think that mediators will get work in such a situation how will they get work people don't even know what it is right absolutely um it's it's so true and i think that things are changing maybe quite slowly but you might have seen that i posted an article from the financial times the new master of the rolls in the uk who's responsible for the the civil um uh, courts even up to the high court um of justice in in the in the uk he has come in he said that the civil law system in the uk in england and wales excuse me needs a complete overhaul and it needs to be much more focused online and it also needs to be focused on providing different options for specific types of disputes uh including and he even he said repeated attempts at mediation before a case can come to a court trial so the fact that somebody so high profile has come into a new position and has said right i want to do a big reform here and mediation and online dispute resolution is going to play a big role is very encouraging for me and i think that it's slowly percolating down in people's um, well, i'll tell you i'll tell you the issue with that issue is that our chief justice of our supreme court was exactly the same thing he came in in, uh, in 2019 in november 2019 of course he's retiring now but he was a major sub he's a major supporter of mediation the problem is that the view of anyone who's at the court system their whole priority is to clear the backlog 
Yeah. And that's ex- that they keep thinking about that. The point is the development of the profession is not happening because because of that. They mm-hmm. to clear out the backlog. What are you going to do? Make sure that it comes at a very cheap price to mm-hmm. the people. If it's going to come at a cheap price, you don't even first of all the value of it. You don't understand. I, I, I again, and this is something that I keep repeating. I mean, in India, there is what do these mediators in the court get? Nothing. I mean, nothing at all if you look at it that way. Yeah. I mean, what per session a person who's who has about fifteen years of experience as a lawyer, you expect him to get a certain remuneration, mm. and that too should be a decent remuneration for him to take it up as a profession. It can't just be a part-time thing that once in a while you walk into a mediation center and you get a matter and that way. So I think the court system is not going to let the profession develop, and which mm-hmm. is where I have a problem with the whole concept of. They, yes, very nice. They're promoting this. People are going to hear about it. Yes, in India also a lot of people would hear about it because the, someone in the court, someone has a matter in the court, and they're told that a certain mediation is happening there. The, the word will go around that there is a concept. Whether they have a good user experience or not, I can't say. but at right. the end of the day the profession has to develop and this way it's not going to happen so i think that intention is good the law of course our law has everything we have the best law in terms of even in the civil procedure code has everything about adr it right. gives gives the parties an option but to the extent that they must take the option yes. at what stage in the matter they have to take it of course that has been laid down but i i mean for me private mediation has to develop this whole yeah. concept of even people are using the word pre litigation mediation these days i'm say what what is pre litigation i that means you've already decided on litigation <laughs> what is pre litigation it's just a private mediation that you want to do because you have a dispute right well yeah look i'm i'm not from a legal background so i don't want to talk um, much about that um but it is it is very important i have heard recently of this concept of opt out mediation i don't know if yeah. you know of this yeah yeah italy about, um, you know, italy has yes. been a major proponent of that yeah yes italy and some very high profile international organizations like the world bank they are doing an opt out system where and i think this is a great sort of compromise not compromise but um sort of halfway house between voluntary mediation where probably most people will not choose to go to mediate mediation and mandatory mediation where you have to so opt out just for people who are listening if they don't know about it is a system whereby you would have to in order to have a civil case you would have to attend at least one you just have to step foot in the room in the mediation room and the, the thinking there is is that once people are in the room and they hear maybe just a very brief ex- explanation of the process that they will continue with the process so i think that's a great idea and i was really um very encouraged to hear that countries like italy and world bank and united nations system are trying this uh, opt out mediation because it does we 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 have to you know we have to move away from you know litigation you know uh uh you know somebody saying who wins and who loses and who's right and who's wrong this is not healthy for society what is healthier is to have people take ownership of their disputes and their conflicts to actually have their own voice heard by the other person to not speak through a lawyer I mean I'm sure that you know lawyers in many different aspects of life do a lot of great things for people but I believe that for the 21st century we need to hear more and the on the other side in the dispute or the conflict needs to hear directly how their actions have uh, affected the other person because that's where the transformative moments come where you understand what your actions have done to the other person then you have the possibility of coming to an agreement but this is no this is what the thing is that all the nice things are some things that if you tell people they'll understand now it's about the implementation this whole opt out system that you're talking about mm-hmm. the fact is that if you do attend that session then yeah. you the they, it's, you don't have to pay for it it's done as part of whatever the court funding or whatever it has to happen so a person is getting a free session yes, and yes. every time mediation and free are always linked to each other 
and then that is the way it is communicated outside that person goes out oh yes it was free mm. the point is that at the end of the day if you don't pay for something do you even perceive a value in it right. so even it could be any opt out system whatever it might be but do not let it come for free absolutely i totally agree it's you, and it has to reach a level when the person actually wants to opt for it and that's the stage we have to reach but it's not getting there it's been years here i mean here also like i said the court system has had it for years but that's right. not the way it's going to be it has to the culture has to happen we have to start there yes we the, whatever these courts are doing to clear their backlog they will have to keep doing it's their fault to create a backlog was their fault they find a way to do it how are they doing it if they are funding it are they let them fund it they're not a problem let it come free to the party if they want to give it but yeah. pay the mediator well He, yes. the mediator should get what a mediator should get it's not because he's supposed to do a social service because the court wants some matters out of the court right. that whole bad mindset has to change i'm okay we call it whatever opt out system whatever you want to call it all kinds of methods available is the mediator getting a remuneration which in is somewhere related to the person's experience and qualification is it is he getting that or not and if he's not getting it then we are not creating a profession and if you're Absolutely. not creating a profession we are not doing something which is a long term thing Absolutely. so so the concept will be very well understood if you go out and elan gives out a sends out a video says look it's very good and this whole concept of you winning and that person losing is not a good thing and win win and everything all those things nice words will go out but at the end of the day the person has to use it and he has to pay for it yes and look one way i was talking to lisa so lisa says you have these community mediation centers which mm-hmm. are funded by okay maybe the state or whoever funds that so mm. the mediation comes for free but i don't know whether the mediator i will have to check with her I, the mediator doesn't really get anything so oh. so finally the whole center might be funded yes maybe. but is the mediator getting what they should get right so um, i i look, i i can't agree more if if we want to live in a more as i said earlier if we want to live in a more peaceful world we have to start investing in the tools of peace and and paying mediators to go out in the community go out in businesses yes. go out in every different type of relationship wherever there are humans communicating with each other we have to pay people to go and stop these problems from festering and developing and becoming things which end up costing the taxpayer millions and millions of dollars and pounds and euros and rupees and yuan and yen you know these are costing our communities huge sums of money it's like we need to tell people this is your taxpayers money you pay for the police you pay for local government you pay for housing authorities if you want to save you your pay for ta- the courts you pay for the courts you pay for the, the salaries of the judges you pay for that infrastructure being created you pay for someone getting mediation for free Yeah. you are funding a dispute do you realize a taxpayer is funding a dispute exactly that's how the free concept works nice. the, when you walk in and say that that particular session is free for you someone has paid for it right exactly finally so we have to turn this upside down we need to profit from the resolution of disputes we need to pro- we need to recognize that we profit from that not only on a financial level which certainly it is on a financial level but on a moral level a spiritual level um and on a logical level as well we want to live in communities where disputes can get resolved quickly and to the benefit of everybody involved and not looking at things in terms of well what does this law say about who's in the right and who's in the wrong i mean let's not forget that laws change i mean laws are written by humans and probably quite often you know in the for the benefit of governments and large corporations laws are written and they get updated so we need to stop looking at the concept of dispute resolution through the lens of litigation because it's the well you know the law is always in the past it was written in the past and now for an issue for a dispute for a conflict that happens now we look at something that happened in the past past so i think actually as developed as the legal uh, sort of system is we need to actually flip it on its head 
and say that alternative dispute resolution is just dispute resolution and litigation should be what is considered alternative but i don't know i don't know we had one i don't know whether you were part of that we had a meeting quite some time back and we were discussing this aspect of how why do people go for arbitration or litigation what is the reason for it because there is something to that why do they do it so one thought thought came up that is it because people don't want to take decisions themselves they want to just leave it on someone okay the other thing is that there is a third person who's out there representing you in the court and you can always blame it on that lawyer or whatever or the judge okay that person didn't decide all right or this guy didn't argue my case all right you don't want to be there taking that decision for yourself so yeah. is that part of our psyche and is if is that creating a problem in using mediation um yes absolutely and i think also human beings naturally think that they are right and certainly that they want to be right um from what i've discovered in my studies of conflict resolution and living in in israel and you know looking at, at those political issues certainly political issues you can see how divided we've become now in the united states and the united kingdom i mean look at brexit the referendum you know how how silly was that an act of folly from a british government to literally put a dividing line down the country you're in or you're out i mean how stupid no, you know no offense to david cameron <laughs> or maybe offense i don't know i don't know but um <laughs> it's 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 mind blowing and we think that that's the best way of making a decision about something incredibly complex that affects so many people's lives that we only get you know they say oh no this is a one chance once in a generation we're in or we're out but what about i want to see a whole spectrum of ideas uh, there's here and there's over here and there's a million things in between let's find the system that works best for everybody not in or out yes or no right or wrong we don't live in a world of black and white we live in a a a a, a myriad of colors and shades and that's the way that we should approach decision making and conflict and dispute and how to resolve those issues um and communication in general we have millions of opportunities available to us it should never be yes or no in or out it's just it's just that's crazy a very, that's a very nice passionate speech this is going to stay with me after 30 years when <laughs> ilan is the prime minister of the uk <laughs> we will play this and he said this is where he came started this is where his old he has such a passion about this whole thing Yeah, I I really feel, you know, and I'm I'm so glad that I came to that master's degree. I it, it, I was literally only interested in it because of my interest in current affairs, in politics, in international relations. Um but then I discovered this whole world of conflict resolution and mediation. I think it's it's something really magical actually. Um bringing people together. We can disagree. but let's disagree in a way where we get the best outcome no but I, yeah no but I, no but I, what i'm trying to do is that maybe this whole culture of mediation that i'm talking about maybe we have to also start looking at from what i was just telling you about people not wanting to take decisions themselves it's a yeah. similar thing about government or well, the government is deciding because right. if the government goes this way or that way you can keep criticizing it but if you i think people have to start taking the onus on themselves in the yeah. communities let's start with communities the people have to say okay this is the way i want things to be done and go out and do it rather than okay there is a government who will which will do it and let's wait for that government to why the government i mean where does that government come in you have to start living your lives as the way you want to live it so i think that is where dispute resolution also that the same issue comes up no one wants to take charge of their dispute yes i think that's um that's an interesting point so i think we should create an atmosphere uh an environment where people are safe when they have their opinion and that they can be wrong uh or 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 not even wrong but their the choice that they make uh that we know uh, you know we can see wasn't the best choice that you know we can't 
we can't allow an environment where people are blamed. You know, we, we need to move away from the culture of blaming. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and actually, I just wanted to make the point that, so, so with, let's say, the example of Brexit, I mean, people did have the say, but still they, you know, so they were empowered to say in or out. Um, but then, of course, because it was binary, it was zero or it was one, it became who is right and who is wrong. No, but in a so, way, look, you might say that the people had a choice of yes and no, but someone else decided the question. And that yeah. is where the issue lies. That why should someone else decide the question for you? And, Absolutely. You, and give you a choice of answers. Yes, we've given you a choice. But we didn't want this choice. This is not our question. <laughs> so I think we have to go down to that basic level. And yes. that is where I think, I don't know whether people are even having discussions on that aspect or not. But I think it's going to, it has to happen from the community as part. And people have to, at community level, start doing it. It'll yeah. convert into maybe at a national level, it'll take its time. Because it's a culture. It's a culture. It's a way that people work together. And that whole collaborative concept to get into community because there are divisions people do make those divisions for a reason even if it, we were talking about you're talking about israel or whatever that fear that is put into people's mind that they should not get together whatever reasons that they have people have for that they keep doing that but yeah. i think but, but are we going to say hi to your mother or not is she around um no and uh, she actually doesn't even live here <laughs> no oh she's okay she stays in another place okay yeah Down, yeah no, close by yeah, yeah. She's not here, but but she's. I think she might still be watching. So, hi, mom. <laughs> um, always hi. wanted to say that. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me also say hi to her. Yes, Ilan is a good boy. He's doing good things. He's going to resolve the conflicts in the world very soon. It's all happening. He's on the right track. But my my mom absolutely. You know, she she wants me to be paid for doing exactly. this work. So, exactly. Uh, you know, I think it's it's kind of frustrating for her that I did my master's degree in 2014, and that you know, even though I've 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 had quite a bit of mediation experience and certainly mediation training experience, I still you know I I cannot support myself financially doing this work. I should be able to because I've I have the skill set, I have the experience. Um, I think I have the kind of the natural, well, I have the passion, certainly, um, and maybe even I have some of the, 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 the natural characteristics, but I, I cannot support myself. And okay, maybe I can hustle more and I can get a bit more money, but it's, it's really, it's, it's too hard. So I'm working also very hard to try to uh, educate people about the concept of conflict resolution. I post things on my Facebook account, um, and I, I'm always, you know, whatever people talk to me, whatever issue it is, you know, I always, you know, tell them about conflict resolution. So it, there are, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll approach a time when there's critical mass and where enough people have got, you know, master's degrees and have, you know, done, you know, workshops and we're all talking about it on LinkedIn. And there will be a point where there is just more people who want to get a mediator involved. Um, but I think, look, I'm telling you, Alan, I think maybe we are just talking within ourselves mm -hmm. and the people who, like the user, like I said, the user has to be given a package. This is how it works. It's going to work. And this is the way I come into your organization. This is the this is what I'm going to be doing. And mm -hmm. however, the arrangement works out. I mean, that arrangement you can work out. But the fact is that you must be able to talk to people about actually implementing something in their organizations or in the communities wherever and uh, the revenue model of it should be very clear yeah. rather than a general thing look conflict resolution is a good thing and this should not happen you should yes. not have conflicts in your workplaces but to actually give a package I think that... one one really uh, important thing that the person who taught uh, me mediation um, really amazing American guy called um, Brian, uh, who might watch this later on. Um, he said that, you know, anytime there's an agreement made between two people, you know, there's usually a dispute resolution clause. Have mediation be the first method of dispute resolution. It should be the first always because it's the quickest. And wait, let me just, um, let me just illustrate this. The community I, cases I work on, um, typically I will speak to 
each neighbor for one hour, maybe even less. And then we'll have a joint meeting for two hours. So I couldn't resolve a neighborhood dispute. And actually the, the civil cases that I've been working on, I think are quite similar because it's you know, small amounts of, of money. Um, four, five hours? Okay, maybe more complex cases. Maybe you need 10 hours, 20, but this is going to be so much less time and money than litigation, certainly, or arbitration. And also, you will probably get a better outcome for yourself because you say what goes into that agreement, what you want in that agreement. If, obviously, if, uh, and I think from my experience, the other side quite, you know, they, they quite often agree on what should go in the agreement. You get to say what goes into that agreement. So it's your agreement. And, you know, that also makes it, I think, more uh, sort of likely that both parties will adhere to the agreement, that what they wanted is actually written down there on paper. So what are we talking about here? Maybe something between three, four hours to 10, 20 hours? Every single agreement made between two human beings should have a dispute resolution clause, and it should say mediation if the parties disagree. Ela, 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 of Ela, I'm, I'm actually expanding the market. I'm saying every time two people want to get into an agreement, they must have a mediator sitting there. Exactly. That's how much we have to expand the market. Because yes. if you at that stage are able to get into an agreement, which is something which is a fair agreement and something which a lot of aspects need to be looked at. A lot of aspects need to be looked at, which a third party when it's sitting there can actually help you do that and put it down. And if that is done, that becomes a very long-term kind of an uh, uh, association and a lot of issues which otherwise would come up will not come up because mm -hmm. that aspect would have been looked at. And two people when they're, obviously they have their interests in mind and they're, they're only looking at drafting it from that perspective. That yes. aspect also needs to be, needs to change. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, I already started doing this. Um, when I was working in Shanghai in 2019, I was working for kind of like a market entry consulting firm, helping international companies to get in to the Chinese market, sell their products and services to the Chinese people. And I had the opportunity, whenever I signed a new agreement for the company, I, t I told the general manager, I said, I'm writing a mediation clause into this agreement. Yeah, yeah, um, so, you know, I've already started doing it and everybody should be doing that. I hope people listening, if they are now or later on to this uh, conversation, um, please write mediation um, into... Before that, please tell them that they must... While yes, before. yes, start from there. Don't just push that. Yes. Well, tell you, mediation clause can come in. Then the next stage of appointing a mediator and everything, all those things yes. will happen. But of course, yeah. when the mediator comes in, when the agreement yeah, is being signed, mediator is going to say mediation is going to be in the agreement. So you know, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So the main thing is to be able to get people to use it in some way, and that's what you're going to do. You're going to yeah. talk to, to you just talk to people and tell them. I'm telling you, you don't the general idea everyone has that's a very good concept, I'm sure. But how will they use it? Just give them an actual thing and just work on something with them. Okay. Yeah. However, look, in terms of initially, you it's a chicken and the egg situation. So to break that, definitely you'll have to come out with an arrangement which one short term kind of thing, and then okay, long term I will do this. But at yeah. least get in, get in, put your foot in the door. Right. Right. Rather than give a general, give them general information on yeah. that. Okay, this is how I'm going to do. I can do it like this. Start yeah. the process off. However, you have to do it. Yeah, yeah. And and I, you know, I think I should also mention that, you know, that mediation is not a cure all panacea. I mean, some disputes will not be appropriate for mediation. Of course, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, if it's if it's a serious crime, a violent crime, you know, um, there will be situations where mediation would not be but at least it should be the first port of call have a mediator tell you because i think most mediators i know and, and this is certainly true for myself if somebody approaches me with a problem and you know says uh, 
oh, you know, I've got this situation with intellectual property in China or, or whatever. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I, look, maybe, maybe this is something where, you know, you need a lawyer or at least have a mediator bring a lawyer in as a subject expert or the other way around. A lawyer bring a mediator in to see if it can be resolved by mediation. So it's not that mediation is like, yep, yeah, every dispute we can resolve through mediation. I'm not... Uh, sort of, you know, unrealistic like that, but at least because of what I've seen mediation do in a room between two or more people who really, really dislike each other and do not even want to talk to each other, the transformation that I've seen in only, you know, two, three, four hours of meetings, we should at least try that first, because if it doesn't, and it goes down a certain route, then the, the costs build up and it becomes more difficult um, to, to, to resolve the dispute years down the line. And, and, and the irony is, is that when things go years down the line, people always say, okay, well, let, let's try last chance. Let's give the mediators a try. It's like, why? Why, why last chance? It doesn't make any sense. But one thing Alan, I would want to put across, which I have put on my website also, that dispute resolution, first of all, sit with each other and sort it. Don't, you don't need to even go for a for mediation. You don't need to get a third party. You can definitely try and resolve your disputes within yourselves. And only then do you come up with something else. And if you can, I mean, whatever basic things that you need to do, I've, I've written that down also. Just put your ego aside. Just negotiate and compromise if you have to. Just do it. Yeah. You don't need anyone else. That's just what I keep saying. Because it's very nice to push the whole concept of mediation and everything. But the first thing is that why can't you say, like I said, you have to be able to take things on yourself first. And if you yeah. can do it yourselves, why do, you, why do you have a third party to sit in? So that whole culture of peace that has yeah. to develop, I think that is also important. Yes. 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 We, we, we can't get our time back. Time is the most precious thing that we have, not money. You can earn, you can always earn more money if you work a bit harder or a bit smarter. You can't get time back. And so think very carefully about how you want to handle a disagreement with somebody. Um, and, you know, uh, if you can't resolve it yourself, approach a mediator just for their opinion and see if they think that it's uh, ripe for mediation. And the best thing is try and resolve them at the earliest yeah. bef and before all those allegations and counter allegations are made yeah. so that the relationship already is gone and that part of it, just avoid it as much as you can. Yes. And that's what uh, starting a, 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 a court case is. That's what happens. One notice goes, some allegations are made, the other one makes something else and that's the end. That's the end for the next 10 years of your life, 15 years of your life. You're just yeah. going to be taking that up. Right, right. Yep. And and of course, as well, as well you know, just a quick point. You know, as I said, I don't come from the legal background, but you know, the concept of justice is justice uh, under the law, but that's not natural justice. It's not human justice. You know, um, you know that might even be a case of who can pay the best uh, lawyer. <laughs> so yep. Yep. I think we we need to radically change the way we think about how we approach disagreements and disputes and conflicts. And uh, even, even the case where somebody wins and somebody loses, if you win, you know, maybe you might get some money or whatever, but you know, your relationship with that other person is gone. That's it. There's no more, you know, if you win and, and, and the other person loses, they're not going to want to talk to you anymore. So, even if you win, you might not really have won because your relationship with that other human being has been destroyed. And that I think is what we need to think about. Let's stop thinking always in terms of, of numbers and finances. Let's think in terms of long-term relationships and helping people uh, in uh, you know, even if you have a disagreement with someone and you think that they have not acted appropriately or that they're wrong, taking them to court, even if you win, might not be the best option for you. 
and, and then you have no you have no guarantee that you'll win anyway. But um, but only thing is, or well, you keep saying I don't have a legal background and all. You don't need a legal background for one reason because law by itself has to be fair and reasonable. And if you see a fair and reasonable situation, you know that this would be the law. And if you see something happening which is not fair or not reasonable, that should not be the law. If it is the law, then that law should be challenged. So, yeah. as a reasonable person, what you what you think should be the is the right approach. The law will support you. It yeah. should support you. And if it doesn't support you, there's an issue there. So to, that, I don't think that should be a worry at all. And you don't need to. I mean, I suppose you don't have to start getting into the uh, the intricacies of interpretation and all at that stage. First of all, you uh, what is it that the parties themselves understand of their own dispute? Yeah. I think that by itself, to be able to get to that point itself is an important point. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So don't worry about this whole legal thing. That's not a problem. I'm not worried about. It. Otherwise, we'll do a we'll do a co-mediation. I, I, I so the legal person will come in, and that's yeah. not an issue. Yeah. So I don't think that. But otherwise, I don't think that should be a worry at all. No, no. I mean, look, I I know I bring my own perspective, and I I think that people who actually who don't have a legal education and legal experience, it's it would probably be valuable to have those kinds of people at the table if everybody at the table is you know got you know legal background and legal mindset maybe just have one person at the table who's going to give that alternative opinion where you could uh, have fresh ideas and fresh exactly. perspective exactly that's what's required so, that whole fresh thing so what are you coming to lisa's heart to heart Oh yes! In, that, in fact, did that start forty-five minutes ago? No, it's going to start in fifteen minutes. Oh, okay, fantastic! I got the time difference wrong. Um, I will try, yes, but um, I might need to go and sit in the sun for some time. <laughs> take your take your phone with you, whatever. Oh, yeah. oh, no. I, 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 but now that you're telling me, I should check the time. But according to yeah. me, it is in the next fifteen minutes. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Think, that, that, that's what it is. I think. So anyway, it was nice talking to you, Dan, and definitely we're going to have lots of more such conversations, and we're going to do something good. No, it's not going to end in these conversations. We're actually going to do something about it. It's not going to be as simple as one theory that we've discussed. We are going to take it up, and we're going to whatever we need to do in terms of discussions, conversations. We have to start making a change somewhere. Absolutely, it's um, it's all about what we do uh, in our in our daily lives to make that change. Um, and I'm really trying to bring, you know, some uh, more peace uh, into the world in, in every way in which I can. Um, but anyway, let me just say before we part ways that, um, you know, we've never met in the real world, but it's really been a pleasure meeting you in various different events. I love your different series um, on YouTube. Um, and so it's been an honor to have this conversation with you and I uh, really appreciate um, you, Vikram, and everything that you're doing to uh, try to you know, develop the concept of, of mediation in, in, in the world. So thanks so much for this opportunity and I look forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you, Ilan, and that's you've embarrassed me as much as you could. <laughs> oh, I, I could, I could probably do better, but I need to know you better. I need to know you. Better. Well, it's always nice to hear some good words. You, it's, you make my, you made my day, kind of thing. But my day is not two now. Only a few hours left in the day, but you made my day. <laughs> it's a nice thing, though. It's always nice to hear good things, and we are going to keep doing some good things together. And we're going to see you in the next fifteen minutes. <laughs> I'll probably see you on another Zoom call. In, yeah, another in fifteen the... minutes. No, Lisa's hard to hard. You have to come there. She needs she needs those needs people there to discuss the whatever she has to discuss today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I'll, I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah. All right. See you. Thanks Bye. so much. Thank, thank you. Yes. No, thank you so much as well. Have a lovely evening yeah. and all the best. Bye. Bye.